you guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a tabletop panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is TableTalk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with the f and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. And we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today my guest is Shane Haller. Shane is the all-time world squat record holder in 308s raw with 925. Best total is 2347 and we're going to talk a lot about background and getting into all that, but I do want to put in there that you played football and wrestled in, was it Division One AA? Uh, D1 at uh, UCF. So the wrestling was, um, there's no like uh, Division One wrestling in uh, Florida, but they have uh, the NCWA, which is like one of those lower leagues in the far, you know, it's like it's in between like a D3 and like a, like a Juco or like an NAI or something like yeah. that. So, yeah. And you got, you got into the sport in 2016, Yep. which is going to be, this is going to be a fun discussion for me because you're, you're, you're on the upswing, right? So you haven't really been around to see how bad it can really suck. Right. <laughs> and, but before getting into all that, I want to get into, because uh, I'm always interested in what the prior development was coming into the sport, mm -hmm. right? So, especially when you're a college athlete as well, because that means there's got to be prior development even before that. Right, right. So, at what point in time did you just first start training? Not weight training training, but training for sport with intent. Uh, I would, I mean, we'll call karate a sport, but I mean, so like when I was a kid, like I didn't want to really do do anything so it's like when i was like uh you know eight nine years old like i was like you know i want to be a little kid watch tv play video games stuff like that my mom was like you're gonna try everything so tried basketball hated it tried soccer wasn't a fan tried t-ball terrible at it and i feel like karate is kind of like uh like as far as like for a kid anyway like you can be pretty unathletic and it's like still something you can do and like be active and stuff and um so from there i, I did karate from probably you know eight oh just before high school and the the place i was doing that at also taught jujitsu um so i got into that for maybe about a year or two and that grappling kind of led me to getting into wrestling once i got into high school so it was all kind of a feeder thing to get to that point and i took those pretty seriously but you know when i showed up to to wrestling you know as a freshman I was six foot one, 165 pounds you know no muscle tone whatsoever and uh so, you know, I, I wanted to be really good at it, but I got the shit kicked out of me with that for at least the first two years I did it. So it was definitely um, like a trial by fire kind of a thing where it's like, you're not going to be good at this for a while, but you're going to have to, you know, if you want to, you got to keep showing up and you got to do all the extra stuff, the off season weightlifting, gaining weight and, and everything else like that to be better at the sport, you know, eventually. Some Were point. you playing football at the same time? No. Nope. So I, um, I, I wrestled all through high school and college, but football was really something that i i did uh i don't want to say secondary but it was kind of like you're a big guy like you could play football so the wrestling coach was also the football coach or an assistant football coach and uh i was probably about 200 pounds as a junior uh going into my junior year and uh i was tall i was about six four 
So my coach was like, well, you know, you come out to the football team, you'll get a little more aggressive, you'll, you know, put on a little bit of weight, and it'll help when you go back to wrestling. So I was like, okay, so I played football my junior senior year, and then uh, was done basically after high school. And uh, I didn't play football again until my senior year of college, where um, I ended up walking onto the football team. And it was the same kind of a thing. I was a little bit bigger than I was probably about 230, 240 ish. I was trying to gain weight for heavyweight. You know, if, if you're 230, 240, you know, the yeah. weight cap's 285. So every summer I'm trying to, you know, take what, you know, uh, those, those serious mass, like those, mm -hmm. those, yeah, those, yeah, those yeah. been like taking shakes and shakes and stuff like that, I'm trying to get bigger. And uh, it was always the same thing. Like, you're a big guy. You, you, you must play football or, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, I don't play football. So it was almost kind of a thing where, I w walked onto the football team because I was friends with a lot of the guys that were on the team and I just had gotten it so long. You must play football. You must play football. So it's like, well, I'll, you know, walk on and see if I can make it. And um, I think they had, let's say a hundred guys or something like that, that showed up to this, this open walk, walk on for the, for the football team. And uh, you know, very immediately I was just kind of like, I'm, I'm in over my head in the sense that like everyone played football all through high school. They were like, they love football. They watch football. And I'm not really like a big football fan. I mean, even like the plays, I remember when we would look at, you know, like uh, we'd have like those manila folders and they rip them in half and then, you know, they draw the yeah. O line, they draw the offense. I would, they, they would have a line, like you're going to run this way. Or you're going to run this way. And that was the, ex I had no idea where the ball was. I had nothing, you know? <laughs> And, um, so we do all this, you know, they, they do the, uh, the informal kind of meeting for the walk-ons for the football team. And, um, you know, I, the, one of the coaches pulls me aside cause he's like, I'm a bigger guy and stuff. And he's like, he's like, what do you, what do you squat? What do you bench? And, you know, just kind of asking my background on it. And I just kind of gave him my numbers and stuff. And they weren't great at the time. I think I probably did like a four Oh five bench leading into that. And maybe like a, like a little more over 500 pound squat. And, um, so a couple of my buddies pre prior to the walk-on, cause they were walk-ons that made the team. They told me the only thing that really, really matters is your 40 time. If you can do the drills, if your stats look good, you're six, three, 270 pounds, somewhere around there, and you can run a decent 40, they'll take you on the team. So I, I remember setting up cones in my backyard at the time. And I literally would go to the gym and, you know, do whatever training wise. And I would just be in my backyard and I bought like $10, $15 from you know sports authority or whatever and i would just practice just running you know <laughs> back and mm. just quick little sprints and stuff and you know sure as shit we we go to the walk-on and you know like i said there's off i was going to be an offensive lineman at 6'3 270 i'm not you know mm -hmm. the most like jump out at you gonna be an offensive <laughs> lineman kind of guy there's guys there's you know 300 pounds whatever and um i just remember like we we did all the bag drills and i felt like i was kind of keeping up and um we just get to that 40 and that was that, that last thing you had to do to kind of show up. So everyone lined up and, uh, I run my 40 and then the coach, it was uh, coach O'Leary at the time. He either, if you, if you did good, you pointed that way and you go to the sideline. If you didn't do good, go back, you know, go back in line. And I ran mine and sure as shit pointed me that way. And so they took one off. I was the only offensive line when they took and they took, couple other skill positions but they took like six guys out of everybody and i remember you know they they posted the little list you had to show up the next day to see what the list was and stuff and uh you know i go up there and i still got that picture on my phone it was like my name was like third mm. on the list and i was like oh shit you know what i mean i made it and uh it kind of led from there and so i was i didn't play as far as i wasn't like on the actual uh the travel team but mm -hmm. i was on the scout team so i was i practiced with those guys every single day and uh you know it's kind of it's kind of like a frat a little bit too when mm -hmm. you're when you're on the football team those guys went out and partied you know three or four nights a week and you know before games after games and i wasn't even playing and i was like i was having a hard time keeping up with that you know what i mean <laughs> so it's just like i don't know i had no idea how they did that but um it was you know it was cool you know what i mean what I really made you want it. to do it though um in the sense of like i was still wrestling so i still planned on going back to wrestling after fo the football season you know so it cut into the football season so i would probably show up the last half yeah and um i had uh the previous year well i will backtrack a little bit so i had wrestled the first three years at ucf my sophomore year i was uh, a match away from being an all-american so i uh you know they have the brackets for the nationals and stuff i'm a pigtail match to even get in and so i win my pigtail match and then i have the four seed right away 
I upset him. I upset the guy in the quarterfinals. And so I make, you know, that, mm-hmm. that round lose. And then I lose in overtime. And, uh, the next year I was just kind of, you know, I was, I was still pretty gung ho about wrestling, but it was just something where I kind of burnt out a little bit. And so halfway through the season, I, but you know, at that same time, I'm still friends with a lot of guys on the football team. And I wanted to do something in the sense that, you know, I, I, I've been playing sports, you know, since, mm-hmm. you know, since I was a kid in the sense, you know, whether it's karate, jujitsu, wrestling, football, whatever through high school. And, uh, so I wanted to do something. And, um, so I was friends with a lot of the guys in the team and a couple of them were walk-ons and I'm like, well, dude, you're big. And I'm getting all these people asking me if I play football and, you know, I don't play football. So I'm just like, you know, this is something I'm going to work towards. So I, I bulked up from probably 250 to 270 that summer. And that was always kind of what I liked the most was just the in between the sports. You know what I mean? Yeah. The off season was the, in the weight room. It was gaining the weight and I really thrived on that. And it's kind of, you know, it wasn't until I wrapped up all my sports with football and wrestling that I realized, well, you know, I can, I can still keep working out and there's, there's competition with that as well. And that's kind of how I fell into powerlifting, mm-hmm. but it was mainly because I had a lot of friends on the team and, um, um, you know, to, to sit there and say I was a division one athlete at one point, you know what I mean? I got a bull ring and stuff. We went to the, uh, the bull, the bull game that year. We were conference champions, you know what I mean? So to be a, a big team like that and that whole process, I mean, I had no idea what it was going to entail going into it. You, you got to show up at 6 a.m. every day for game film breakfast. You got to get your ankles wrapped at the trainers and stuff, practice more film. And like I said, my concept of plays was literally like circle yeah. You're going this way, yeah. that way. I mean, so I had no idea way over my head, but it was an experience that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely grateful for. And it kind of really, uh, you know, I think it just benefited me a lot in my life, just as far as just like, you know, you, you start something, you finish something, no matter how hard it is, or, you know, if you feel overwhelmed by it, you know, I definitely uh, stuck it out to the end. And, Go, uh, going way back to when you first started wrestling, you're, <clears throat> I kind of have a similar story where, I mean, what they called me back then was a fish, you yeah. know, because you, <laughs> you don't win shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is, I don't like asking questions I can't even answer myself because I don't know why I stayed, mm-hmm. but why did you, because I had two years of the, the getting beat all the fuck, I mean, not even close, like Dude, all like, the time. Why, wh- what made you stay? I think it was, I had a lot of friends that were on the team. And um, so like that part was kind of like, well, you got to stick it out with your buddies. You know what I mean? Like if they're starting it, you're not, there would be kids that would show up and like, maybe if I am on the verge of quitting my freshman year, right? Like, I don't like this, or this is, this sucks or whatever. They would quit. And I just remember like how like people would kind of look at them for quitting, you know what I mean? Like they were soft or like, you know, it was, um, you know, it just, just a weird association to it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that, but honestly, I mean, if I'm, I'm being very real about it, my mom has always kind of instilled this thing in me where it's like, you finish what you start in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cheesy saying that's coming from my mom, but like, with anything it's like mom i'm sick go to school today go to school and if you can't get through first couple classes come home football you know what i mean like in high school we were oh and ten my senior year we didn't win a game you know what i mean we probably went three and seven the year before that so like it wasn't like i was like i love winning or whatever it was like we got the shit kicked out of us all the time but it was the same thing. I remember probably the third or fourth game that year and, you know, we're losing, we're getting hammered. And I'm like, mom, I don't want to do this anymore. She's like, you started it. You're going to finish the season. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it, but even with that football thing, by the end of the year, they select one, you know, we have an all-star game. So it's like, we have 20 teams in the County and then they have a North and South and then they pick the best guys from, you know, the County basically to kind of compile those teams. One guy from my team got sent my senior year and it was me. You know what I mean? I was the uh, offensive MVP as an offensive lineman for my high school team. You know what I mean? So like that kind of stuff kind of told me like, you know, it's if it sucks, it's hard, but like it's going to pay off a little bit. If you keep putting your best foot forward, it's going to pay off in the end. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm going to get something out of it, you know? So I was raised with the same same circumstances. If you start something, you don't quit. And uh, I played so many sports. I hated like soccer the first day I hated, you know, I couldn't breathe, you know, all kinds of shit because I had asthma. Mm-hmm. And because I fucking start, you know what I'm saying? It was, and even now, you know, I, I look back and I wonder, was that, yes, it was a good thing to learn, but sometimes I wonder if, if I, if I take it too far, like there's, there's probably a lot of shit I probably should have quit. Mm-hmm. 
way before I did. Yeah. But because it's so fucking ingrained, you know, with the kind of like the same thing that you're saying there, that it's so ingrained in there. You have, well, you said you in college, you walked away from wrestling halfway through. Mm -hmm. How hard of a decision was that to do? A lot because it was the same kind of thing where I'd never quit anything. Yeah. You know, I'd never not finished it. And I remember um, it was halfway through the year. We had just went to a tournament up in, uh, I can't even remember what, it might have been New Orleans or uh, South Carolina or something like that. We went up to a tournament, Tennessee. It was in Tennessee. And I didn't win a match. We had a dual tournament, so you wrestle a bunch of different teams. And um, I didn't win a I didn't win a match. And I, I remember the last match I had, I just I wrestled this kid and I got cradled real quick and I was it was done. And I'm just like, I'm over this. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I was just not in it. And um, so I, I sat down and the coaches were honestly the ones that that made it the hardest where it wasn't something where it was like, Hey, I'm done. You know, see it was like I had to like sit down with the coaches like several times and they tried talking me out of it, talking me out of it. And I was like, no, no, no. And, um, you know, eventually like, I, you know, I, I just kind of parted ways with it. And then eventually I was going to, um, come back my senior year for it. And I practiced with the team, you know, in between football practices and stuff like that. But I ended up breaking my nose, um, my senior year. Like it was the day after new year's, I was wrestling a kid and, uh, we were get, we got into a scramble and, uh, I went to go turn around into him and he swung back and threw his, threw his elbow in my face. I, you know, it wasn't on purpose, mm -hmm. but, um, smashed my nose. And I just remember I went like this and my nose was like under, under my eye. Right here. And I was just like, I was like broke. And my coach is like, just look up. I'm like broke. And, uh, blood started coming down and stuff. And, um, I, it's still kind of broken. You can still kind of see, cause um, we, the, the space we trained at, it was off campus. There was a, it was a Muay Thai gym at the same, same spot. And those guys would break their nose all the time. And, you know, however dumb this is, whenever they would break their nose, they would take pliers and they would just yeah, pop yeah. it right back in. So I was just like, I just remember I went to the bat, the bathroom, I saw it and I was like, I looked like sloth from the Goonies. <laughs> and I remember I came back out and I told the coach, I was like, I was like, fix it, fix my nose. And so I sat down in the chair and he, he cranked on it for a little bit. And, uh, you know, we, we couldn't, he said it as best he could. And then I went to the, the, the ER or whatever. And they were like, well, you know, it's, it's not broken so bad that it needs to be fixed. We can either probably fix it, make it a little worse or not do anything. And I'm just like, cause they'd have to break it, yeah, set it yeah. and everything else. And I was like, this is, you know, not for me. And then I'd have to finish the rest of the season with, you know, face mask and everything else like that. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. So it was kind of snake bit from the start, I guess, for that senior year. But, um, that's, it, it worked out because as when that didn't, pan out for me my my roommate at the time he was powerlifting he was training and stuff like that and him and i had wrestled from high school you know what i mean I, I, he's my best friend since like seventh grade and so we wrestled together all through high school we wrestled together in college and then when he kind of burnt out with wrestling he got in uh to powerlifting he was training at the gym that we went to the other guy uh lance hickey that was about an 1800 pound total at 240 and then uh nate mccool who was like I said, at the time, the youngest teen ever or to, uh, he was the strongest teen ever. He had like a 2,100 pound total at 350 pounds, 19 years old. And so he was training with them. So he got in. So I kind of followed, I followed him into wrestling. So I followed him into powerlifting and, um, he eventually kind of transitioned out of it. But then, you know, I, I, I caught the, uh, the iron bug, I guess. Yeah. And then with, I was, I was totally without the perspective you have now, if, if I was talking to you when you were wrestling at that time and asked you how important and how all into that you were without the perspective you have now answering as you were then, what would you say? I would say it was the most important thing in my okay. life because right. I was, you know, similar to what I was telling you yesterday. It's like, you know, I, I watched film on it all the time. There was, you know, if there was a documentary about wrestling or if there was, I was all wrestling all the time. I did. I loved watching it. I loved going to practice. I loved just the whole deal of it, you know what I mean? And um, obviously, like, you know, looking at the level of preparedness I, I put into powerlifting now compared to then, it's kind of like what you're saying as far as like your level of yeah. all in. Like, to, at that point, I had never been more all into anything than I had to that because it yeah. consumed eight years of my life. But, um, you know, there's looking back on it now, it wasn't necessarily that I wasn't as all in. I just didn't have the means as far as I wasn't smart with my diet. I wasn't smart with recovery. I wasn't smart with all the the extra things that I think that, you know, really kind of help progress you as, as far as, you know, getting the more, the most bang for your buck kind of stuff as far as your performance, but also kind of keep 
the longevity aspect of it. You know what I mean? If you get banged up in wrestling, you don't know how to sit there and warm up or stretch or anything else like that. Like you're just going to keep carrying that on and not really addressing that problem. You know, that's why I put that perspective in there, you know, because as you move through powerlifting, that perspective shifts, yeah. you know, when you talk to, <laughs> you talk to some people now and it's, a, I've talked about this on the podcast, you know, they'll, they'll tell you they're all in, but they're all in as the most all in that they've ever known. Right. Yeah. You know, five years later, that kind of changes a little bit, but I think you do get to a point where you rise to certain or you either fall in certain sports or you rise to a certain level in certain sports where you get a way better perspective mm -hmm. of what that really means within and then you'll look back on those other sports and be like okay same thing you said it you you were but you didn't have uh, knowledge the education to be able to take more advantage of the tools that you mm -hmm. had where a lot of lifters are that way now you yeah. know they say that they're all in and they here's the cat they know that there's more knowledge and education out there for them to be able to become better but they refuse to look at it right right where in some places and we'll talk about this in some places i do think there's a time to cut it off mm -hmm. you know before meat because you have to take that shit away yeah and just filtering on what you're doing but then keep a more open perspective throughout can we talk a little bit about this over the weekend? So I want to serve. Well, so how did you get into powerlifting? I don't want to get too far down the line. So here. we'll, yeah. So I wrap up, uh, football's done in, you know, December time. Mm -hmm. I go back to wrestling. I break my nose and then, you know, I'm done with that. So now I call, all I kind of have at this point is just, you know, I'm just going to the gym. Right. And so my buddy, Tom, at this point, he's competing in powerlifting. Uh, the guys he was training with, they were all competing. You know, they're, they're going to like, this gym that like it's a small little hole in the wall it's got a mono lift i've never heard what that is before they're using they're doing like deficit deadlifts and all these goofy training things that i've never even seen you know i'm just kind of like when you when you don't really know what you're training it's like you can say i'm training powerlifting and you do squat bench and deadlift but then you just train like a bro you're doing yeah. curls and you're doing whatever the hell else so all my training was very unstructured i would show up you know what i mean but it's very unstructured i didn't know what i was doing and um so i started training a little bit with them uh summer and uh you know i got pretty pretty big i mean i probably ended up gaining uh another 10 or 15 pounds so i was probably like 275 ish that summer and i was really kind of hammering you know squat bench deadlift to the best of my ability at that point you know i graduate college i go back home and um at this point like i'm not really sure what i'm really doing with my career i got a degree in criminal justice you know um, but I'm not going to end up pursuing a career as a, you know, a law enforcement or uh, corrections or anything like that. So I'm really kind of like, it's that weird transition time. I go from all this structure from, from sports, like I, my whole year revolved around the sports seasons, you mm -hmm. know? So it's like, I, I would go from wrestling to the off season, getting ready for next season or football or whatever. So coming out of that, I had nothing. And I just kind of felt very like lost, you know, mm -hmm. like I had like, like, what's my purpose right now? You know what I mean? What am I working towards? What am I doing? So I'm trying to figure out, you know, what my job's going to be. I'm working uh, as a substitute teacher at my school, helping coach wrestling and football at the same school I went to. And um, so I'm doing that, but, you know, I'm not making any money as a sub and stuff. And, you know, I'm just going to the gym, right? And so um, I'm doing my powerlifting stuff that I was doing in college at the gym. I'm, you know, I'm benching, I'm squatting, I'm deadlifting, but no real structure to it. My form's probably pretty, pretty bad. And uh, I meet another kid at the gym who's kind of similar along those lines. He's doing the same kind of thing, no real structure to it, but we watch powerlifting on YouTube. You know, we've seen all these different videos and stuff. And um, so he, him and I end up training together. You know, he's a smaller guy, about a 165. And um, so we train together for a few months. And uh, he's like, you know, I think I'm going to do a meet. And um, in my head, I, I had this, you know, the same kind of attitude that everyone has is like, well, I don't want to do a meet until I'm ready for a meet. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I remember being in college. So I was like talking to Nate or whatever. I was like, the first the first meet I do, I want a total 2000 pounds, which is stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just looking back <laughs> at it. It's just like, you know, if I could talk to myself, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to compete until I'm ready to do that kind of thing. But it's like, I don't even know what ready for that means because I've mm -hmm. never even competed. I'm not even training with structure or anything. Yeah. Know? And, um, so he goes and does this meet and he comes back and he, he has a pretty good meet, I guess, you know, but he, the same thing he's lost and doesn't really know what's going on. And he ends up running into this guy at the meet, Brian high note, who kind of showed him, you know, what was kind of going on. Here's, here's where you need to warm up. You're in this flight, you know, there's kind of the, the rules of the whole deal. And so he ends up coming back and, uh, we're still training at, you know, the LA fitness of the commercial gym we're at. And, um, He's like, you know, I think he's, he's got a gym. This guy that helped me out at the meet, he's got a gym. Let's, you can go check it out. 
I was like, all right, man, like, you know, let's go do that. And so we go over there probably December, 2015. And so we show up there and it's, it's Brian, it's uh, Morgan man and uh, Donnie Lynn. These are two other guys that I still train with today. And um, so I go over there and I, I get a real crash course as far as, you know, what powerlifting is, you know, I mean, they're, we're squatting the first day, right? That's the first mm -hmm. thing we do is squat in a monolift. I don't know what the hell a monolift is. I've never seen anything like that. And so my, I, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm just going to max out. You know, that's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I got to show out a little bit. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I got to, I got to flex on these guys a little bit. And, you know, I, I squat high or my form's terrible. I have one of those like Valio belts, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You get it like a uh, sports authority or whatever. So, I mean, you know, no real, real structure to it or whatever. And so they kind of like, I don't want to say humble me real quick, but just kind of like, no, this is what you need to be doing this, that, or whatever. And same thing. We go to bench, my butt's popping off, you know, my elbows are flaring out. I have no arch or anything else like that. And so they, you know, from there, it was just kind of, it was, it was like, all right, you, you think you're strong kind of going into it. And very quickly you're humbled down to like, well, none of this is good. You know what I mean? And so they kind of started giving me some structure and it was a, it was an equipped gym. So that, you know, I'm coming from not even knowing what powerlifting is to like these guys are squatting in suits and benching mm -hmm. in shirts and, you know, they're benching off boards and using bands and chains and all this other stuff. And I, I had no idea about it, but very quickly I came back to having, you know, we we're probably only a crew of like six or seven people, you know what I mean? Like kind of rotating in and out, but you know, very quickly I got that team atmosphere again, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you, you show up and everyone's there at a certain time and we're all cheering each other on and we're all working hard and doing what and it was it was very quickly that I was just like, all right, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this. And um, so if I joined that gym in December, I had my first meet February 16th, 2016. And, uh, you know, I, again, I have these very big aspirations. I'm going to total 2000 pounds at my mm -hmm. first meet and I'm going to do this, this, this. And uh, I go out and I think I went I went six for nine. I had a 680 squat close stance and I'm, I'm a tall guy so i mean i'm it's the opposite way yeah, i would yeah, want to squat yeah, you know yeah, yeah but uh you know looking back on it, it's still kind of you know for, for what it was impressive so 680 squat i went two for three i had a 430 bench i went one for three you know ugly my butt's popping up yeah. i'm doing all these different tricks to keep my butt down and you know whatever bouncing it off my chest with the paws and stuff and then uh, deadlift, I went uh, three for three. That was the, the highlight of the meet. And that was my, my strong lift at that point. I had like a 37 pull, ugly as all hell, all cat backed mm -hmm. up and no, no real technique. But like, it was enough to where like, you know, I finished the meet six for nine, 18, 47 total in sleeves. And, you know, you, you get your trophy, you know, your participation trophy or whatever the hell else. And I was just like, when's the next one? Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was hooked. And, um... So that was in 2016, beginning of 2016. And um, from there, signed up for another meet in July and um, started training for it again and stuff. But I had had some, some back injuries in college from just training like, you know, like a bro or meathead or whatever, where they were undiagnosed. But I think I had herniated some discs in college where, you know, I would be squatting and I'd feel something go on my back. And then, you know, I can't really walk around for a, you know, a couple of weeks or something like that. You go to, I, I remember going to the school clinic at the college and it's like, I hurt my back. You know what? You don't, you don't know what you're doing. Right. So it's like, no, I'm laughing. Cause I've been to school I, you, you, and yeah. you show up and it's like my back squatting and they're like, okay, well don't squat. Don't squat. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, all right. I remember buying like those, uh, those icy hot strips mm -hmm. that you can put on your back. <laughs> and I just remember being like laid up in my bed, like, like sore back, can't walk. And I'm just like, you just want to get ready, you know? quick as you know uh healed up as soon as you can to go back and train mm -hmm. and stuff you know so i had had probably two or three incidents like that in college and you know they they flared up they went away and i just kept training never never thought anything of it and, um getting ready for this meet in july i had uh i was doing some dimmel deadlifts you know and i had probably 20 rep set or something mm -hmm. like that and i just remember something going in my back and i was like and it was it was like the ones in college but it was like much worse than the ones i had mm -hmm. in college and, uh, I, you know, I shut it down and, you know, I just, I, I remember I, I like, I set up a band and I was just like, you know, they're just like, oh, well, you probably just pinch a little something in your back and I'm just hang upside down, decompress it, you know, mm -hmm. hit some reverse hypers and it'll be good. And I, I came into the gym probably like for like a week or something like that doing that. And it just kind of, I didn't say get worse, but it was like, it was like debilitating. I mean, I couldn't put my shoes on. I couldn't, 
you know, sleep comfortably. I mean, it was, it was terrible. And, um, so I was like, okay, well, I really got to kind of get this looked at. So I remember, um, I saw an orthopedic surgeon and I kind of told him what was going on. I got an MRI on my back and, um, they, they said, well, you got uh three or four bulge discs, extruded disc and extruded is like the third kind of worst one you can have where like, you know, little jellies coming out of your, mm -hmm. your spinal cord and it's getting on a sciatic nerve and, you know, shutting your, it was shutting my, my right leg down and stuff and, and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, you need surgery. And he's like, you know, typical kind of, you know, doc, he's like, I'll write you a script for some painkillers and this, that, or whatever. And you're all set to go. And I just remember I went out to my car and I sat there for a second. And I was like, I just started this. I really mm -hmm. like it. And now this guy telling me like, I need surgery. And you know, if I need surgery, like, I don't, I mean, am I going to be able to come back and do this again? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, whatever. I'm, I remember playing football in college. There was a couple of offensive linemen that, you know, they're on scholarship and they hurt their back doing whatever. And then they get surgery and they're like 18, 19 mm -hmm. years old. And then a back surgery is that's a band aid, man. Like mm -hmm. you get a back surgery at 19, you're probably getting another one at 40. You're probably getting another one at 55 and so on and so forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, I want to do that. And, um, so at that point I was kind of just like, I need to, you know, really kind of start thinking of some different things. And, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give up on this. You know what I mean? I really like this. I, I think I can be good at this, you know? And, um, so previous, when I was still training at that, that LA fitness with, with my buddy, before we, we joined the powerlifting gym, there was another guy there that I remember I used to see. And, um, he was, you know, you, you see those people at the gym that they're like, like goofy lifts and stuff. And you're just like, what the hell is that guy doing? Like, you know, for nerd or something like that. You know goofy, I mean? goofy, like nerd or goofy. Like he's, he was kind of jacked and doing goofy lifts. He wasn't jacked. So he was it's, definitely like, he was just, he was just yeah. doing goofy stuff, but he yeah. was wearing like, you know, he was from FSU. So he had like a black FSU shirt. He had black FSU slides on and just like spent, I, I was like, why are you wearing like those, like those tights benching? I was like, what are, what are you doing? And, uh, anyway, so that guy ends up joining the gym and his, uh, the gym that we're at he ends up making his way over and his name's sean danner and um lo and behold that guy ends up becoming my coach you know that i've had all the way up through my powerlifting career at this point but he um he had done some weightlifting stuff in college and he's like he wasn't super strong at that point but he he knew the science of everything you know what i mean he read up on all the books the 531 the juggernaut training the west side methods everything he was very very smart you know and um so we were training together and we became really good friends while we training at, at Brian's gym and um and I jacked my back up and you know I'm talking to him and I, I told him all this stuff about you know I, I think you know I'm, I might need surgery or I might need this that or whatever and he's like well you know we, I can we can try some different like rehab stuff and we can you know work on some different stuff as far as like strengthening your core and different like rehab movements and everything else like that and we, we might be able to salvage a little bit of this so um we we did that for a little bit and I remember it was kind of like it was like you know i just i didn't know like any like the smart you know rehab kind of stuff or anything like that but they sean and his roommate nick who are both the owners of pinellas barbell mm -hmm. the gym that i that i go to still um they were roommates and i just remember they were both like nick had been a trainer for forever so he kind of had a little bit of knowledge on this stuff and um i just remember like you know, i'd go over there and we all just we became really good friends but it, would be, it started through this rehab stuff you know and we'd go over there and we'd hang out and like I'd be like laying on the floor and I remember he had like a, like one of those like big poles or whatever. And they'd be like poking different things or whatever. And like, tell me been this way, been that way, you know, stretch this, stretch that. And, um, so that coupled with, um, working with a really good chiropractor that, uh, I was referred to, uh, Dr. Eric Nye, who's still up in Clearwater, Florida. He, um, he was a lifter too. And, um, he's basically, you know, it, it, it was somebody that he knew it was kind of the deal. So in the sense that I didn't want stop training so he wasn't going to tell me that i need to stop training but he reviewed my mris and looked at everything and he goes well you know i'm not gonna sit there and tell you to stop training this is something that you know you'll probably have for the rest of your life but as long as you sit there and you treat it you rehab it and you manage it you don't need surgery like that's if an orthopedic looks at an mri and sees something wrong medical protocol is you need this mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and so but that's not the end all be all like you don't have to do that so i saw him for probably, you know, twice a week for maybe two or three months between that and the rehab work I was doing with Sean, we kind of, we fixed my back 
and um or to the point where i was able to start training yeah. again <clears throat> um and so in between that point i was uh like i said i'm still at this this equip gym they threw me in a pair of uh predator briefs those those double ply ones we might have gotten them from you guys honestly and um so i that that kind of started my my wide squatting like i was like i was very up and down close stance high bar squat and so to alleviate some of that pressure on my back, we got me squatting wider, more upright and everything else like that, squatting down to the box at first. And um, so I did that for a little bit. And um, eventually, you know, with Sean was helping me out so much with this rehab stuff that, you know, I kind of asked him, I was like, well, would you, would you be interested in maybe like coaching me or helping me out with some programming? And, uh, you know, he had never done anything like that before either, but he was, him and Nick were, you know, they, they were roommates, but they had for years been talking about trying to open their own gym and start their own thing. And Sean had all this knowledge of, you know, how to program and train people. And Nick, you know, was a trainer for so long that he had all this knowledge about the gym business and, you know, how to operate it and run it and stuff. So they wanted to open their own gym. And um, so I was just, you know, I ended up kind of getting in with Sean with this, uh, the coaching thing. He had had all this knowledge, but he didn't have anyone to really program mm -hmm. or train. So I was kind of like his guinea pig a little bit. And um, his philosophy was very different from what i was doing with where it was more of a conjugate style training with the equip lifters his whole thing was very much volume and frequency so i would go from having you know a, a speed day a heavy day you know and everything else to now you're doing you know squatting benching deadlifting twice a week squatting and deadlifting in the same day and but all much much lighter higher reps but you're doing frequently mm -hmm. you know and um so from there, you know, I ended up kind of transitioning to a different gym and um, I was using Sean's programming, but I would say I was kind of, you know, again, I'm like, you know, probably a f one year into the competing, I was doing maybe about 75% of what Sean was saying. So he would, he would program something and, you know, I'd be like, well, this is too light. I don't want to do that. So I just kind of add did, a did he know that? Oh yeah. So okay, I would, right. I would send it to him. I would, I would send him videos and yeah. stuff and he's like, well, that's not what I programmed. I was like, yeah, but you know, you know, every new lifter excuse, but this felt good and yeah. I felt like it's, it's okay. And so maybe for the first like two meets I was with him, I would do that where I would kind of tweak a little, oh, it's a lot of it of what he was doing, but you know, it, the compliance got better meet to meet. So maybe that first meet I was with him, I did maybe 75% to the, to the T of what it was. And, um, we ended up doing a meet in December, 2016. So this would have been my third competition and it was in wraps. And, um, thing i went in there with this i want a total two thousand pounds two thousand pounds you know i think powerlifters get very attached to numbers you mm -hmm. know you think? um yeah <laughs> and uh so it's like that's like the, the carrot you know what i mean like and it's like in your head it's like I'm, if i total two thousand like this is going to be the best thing ever mm -hmm. and my life's going to totally change and do all this stuff and so you, you chase it you know what i mean mm -hmm. and what um, changes because as soon as you do that you want 21 it doesn't matter that's you what, know what i mean like it's it's nice for about five minutes <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you're like well that wasn't that hard i could probably do a little more you know and um so that we meet together and um i end up squatting 782 i bench 463 and then uh i deadlift so i open at 672 right and so at this point i went uh three for three on squat i went two for three on bench so i was a little behind to where i wanted to be and i open at 672 and in the back room i noticed like my callus is like starting to kind of peel a little bit on the warm-ups and that's never a, a good you know yeah and so I, I go 672 and 755 is, is 2000. So I just, I load, I load it right up and, um, I get it just about to lock out. And then this whole thing just rips clean out. Right. And I'm pissed and I go in the back and, you know, you're doing all the, the tricks, you're super gluing it, you're packing chalk in there and everything else. And you go in a corner and you listen to some mm -hmm. motivational thing. You start kind of tearing up a little bit and, you know, you're sniffing the salts and everything you get fired up and I go back out there to do it again, get to the same spot and it just peels right out of my hands. So 1917. And, um, so again, it's like, I'm making progress, you know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like I'm working my way up. I go from 1847 to the, the, uh, the 1917, there was a bench only meeting there, you know, between, but, um, yeah, so I hit, I hit that 1917, but it's still not right there. So, you know, and then of course I do, again the newbie deal i sign up for a meet three months later i'm right there but i'm not it's like we talked about the mm -hmm. other day it's it's the executing at that part um so 
I sign up for this next meet. It's in uh, February or March, somewhere around there. So I have like not a lot of time, you know what I mean? Like looking at it now, it's like I, if I'm going to do a meet, it's six months apart at the least. So yeah, I have at least yeah, some time to yeah. do some kind of growing and then peaking, right? Because yeah, yeah, peaking yeah. takes three months about. So it's like I need to do a little, otherwise you're just spinning your wheels, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't do any of the growing, I just wanted to sit there and go right and do another meet. And um, so this one was a walkout meet. It was a USPA. And um, so I, I show up to that meet and uh, had a pretty good prep. Um, well, again, going over uh, Sean's program stuff, compliance was better than the last meet, but it was maybe 85, 90%, you know, and um, just, you know, everything that he had on there, I, I kind of bumped those last numbers and stuff like that. And uh, I missed my last squat and I missed my last deadlift. And I'm just kind of, you know, kind of feeling flat, you know, going into the meet now. And at this point, he's kind of like, just shut it down two weeks out. You need to rest up big and, you know, don't do a whole lot of heavy lifting. We're going to do, you know, some speed stuff kind of going into it just to prime you up. But you just need to rest. You know, you're feeling mm -hmm. good. You just need to rest. And uh, so I go to that meet and um, I squat 788. So six more pounds than what I just did in the mono lift. But for me, walking out was, yeah. was the yeah. hardest damn thing. And um well, sidebar on that too. We'll, we'll just uh, well, you got a wide stance too. Wide stance, but the four, four weeks out from the meet. Now, I'm, I, I feel like I've been pretty privileged in my powerlifting career to sit there and cross paths with really smarter people than myself, mm -hmm. or just well-known people that have done this. You know, and at this gym that I was training at at the time, Gorilla Bench, mm -hmm. there used to be this old guy that would come in on Sundays because we'd all train on Sundays, and. uh the gym gorilla bench at the time was like, it was a old salty gym. You got a bunch of older guys and stuff like that. They're throwing on all their fucking briefs, all the fucking horse liniment. They're talking shit to each other. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I, I like this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And this old guy used to come in and he wouldn't squat, but he would just watch us. You know what I mean? He'd come in with his coffee, he'd sit down and he'd watch us. Well, that old guy was Fred Hatfield. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't know who he was at the time and stuff like that. And then once you kind of find out, you're like, oh, this guy squat a thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. Like the second guy to ever do it. You know, he's smart as hell. And, um, he would, he would always just have like these like Yoda gems, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. these like little, I remember I was warming up once and he said, why are you doing so many warm ups?" And I was like, well, you know, I'm just, you know, plate, plate, plate. He goes, what did you just say? Warm up. And he mm -hmm. wiped his finger across my forehead and he's like, you seem pretty warm to me. <laughs> he's like, you're good. And, um, and just other things like that, you know, he was really big on the, the cat training stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but it what i do now where you don't need to do as much as you want to hit the meat as long as it's fast enough and it feels mm -hmm. you feel like you're in a good place i remember he had told me when he did that thousand thousand eight or thousand fourteen or whatever it was he'd only done maybe 880 leading into that but he did it so fast that he knew he mm -hmm. was good for the thousand you know yeah so um four weeks out from this meet he goes he goes why do you wear those shoes i had a pair of chucks and um you know, black converse or whatever I was like, well, they're flat. You know, I like them. They're, they're good for my wide stance. He goes, I used to wear a pair of heeled shoes. You need to start wearing heel shoes. So four weeks out from the meet, Fred Hatfield tells me to start wearing heel, mm -hmm. heel shoes. I'm going to wear heel shoes. Terrible idea looking back at it in <laughs> retrospect. You know what I mean? Because it's like I'm wide. So like I got to yeah. get out into a split basically in heels. So now I'm mm -hmm. pressed forward. And um, I just remember, you know, like I said, going out to that meet, it was, it was walked out. It was in wraps. And um, my walkout was – it was okay, but it was still like, that was the scariest part of the squat, you know? That's also going from flats to heels too? In four weeks. Yeah. Okay. So, and I just missed my last squat. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I show up to this meet and, um, I remember I had, uh, Jen Rotzinger wrap my knees and she's, you know, all time world record holder at 114, you know, super badass power lifter. And so she was wrapping my knees and I just remember I was going out for my last squat. I did, uh, I opened a 727 good. I went 771 and I remember when I walked out to 771, I got right on my toes and I felt like I was about to fall forward and dump into the rack. And I just, you know, we were talking about thinking mm -hmm. while you're lifting the other day, I was just like, sit, 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 sit. And so as soon as I was about to fall forward, I just sat back, squatted it, came up with it. And I had missed 775 in, in, uh, in training. That was my last heavy squat. So at this point I'm like, okay, well, I'm good. You know what I mean? It didn't feel that bad and it was good. And, um, so we're, we're wrapping, uh, for the meet and this meet was outside. So it was like, it was at a, a beach hotel kind of deal. It was like right on the water. 
it was up on this platform where they used to have bands, you know, com- mm. you know perform and stuff. So you had to walk up these stairs to get to this platform. And they had two chairs where you could, uh, you get wrapped up and stuff like that. And then once you go out to squat, there's two platforms and you're just looking out like, you know, usually when you squat, you like try and mm-hmm. find some, it's the ocean. So it's like, oh, fuck. so there's nothing, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I remember there was like a buoy out there. So mm-hmm. like everyone's like, look at the buoy, look at the buoy. And um, so I remember she was going to wrap my knees and like, she had just wrapped uh, another guy that was lifting, uh, Tom Mahoney who's another older guy and stuff like that that she had come up with training wise. And uh, so her, her forearms are pumped at this point. Like I'm the sixth time she's wrapping somebody. Right. And I just remember she, <laughs> she wraps him. I go to sit down and she wraps me and she's like spent, she's sweating. She rips nose torque to wrap my knees and she's like <laughs> yelling at me and all this. And I, so I go out there and squat this, you know, 788. And, uh, it's a grinder and I'm, I'm coming up and I stop halfway up and I'm push, push, push. And it's like, you know, when you, you kind of mm-hmm. just go over the edge and I just come right up with it. And, uh, so I get that 788 squat. Uh, I go out, I go two for, no, no, I go two for two on bench. I got a 479 and then, uh, I'd call it cause I got a gnarly back cramp and stuff. And it was like, it took everything for me to get that, that one squat up or that bench up. And, um, then I go to pull and, uh, at, at this point, you know, like my back smoked and stuff. We had a, a massage guy working on us in between, uh, squat and deadlift. And, uh, I go out and I open, I think at like 683 comes right up. I go 733. That's 2000 even on the dot. And, um, so I, I, uh, I go out there and I, I pull that up, locked it out. No problem. And, you know, just kind of just like to kind of backtrack, I guess, a little bit, you know, might kind of mess with the continuity a little bit. But prior to that, like, you know, way, way, way way back in the day, I just remember like my first and earliest kind of memories uh, as far as like strength sports. I remember watching World's Strongest Man with my stepdad. Like, that's that's just like what we did. You know what I mean? We'd watch. He was all into sports. I wasn't into sports, but I like this. There's cool. You know what I mean? Strong stuff or whatever. And I remember he bought me my first dumbbell set you know when i was a when i was a kid and i just remember doing like curls in my basement with like 20 pound dumbbells and stuff and um he he got me into football like i I said i didn't like football but he liked football so i did football and he was really fired up about it and stuff and um he ended up getting you know him and my mom ended up splitting at one point and then he ended up getting really sick and so he ended up passing away probably a couple months prior to that and uh i just remember he was in we, we were going to visit him at hospice and uh he was, uh, you know, it's kind of in and out a little bit. And so it, it probably did, you know, he might not even have heard it, but I just remember I told him, I was like, Russ, I'm going to total 2000, man. It's going to be for you. And, uh, so, cause you know, he, he, without him, I wouldn't have really gotten into like the weightlifting stuff, you know what I mean? Or just football or sports in general. So like, he really kind of got me into that. And, um, so I just remember I, I, I pulled that, that deadlift and my mom's there and my dad's there. And, uh, my, my parents got divorced when I was like five and he, did not like each other. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like kind of growing up, but like they're together at this meet. And this is probably like the first sports event, you know, through high school and college, like, like together. And like, they're like, they're being okay and stuff, you know? And, uh, I just remember I pull up that seven thirty three, and I like look over at him and I kind of like, I have to like swallow, like crying. Cause it's like, you know, I, I told him I was going to do it. I did it. My parents are right there. And like, you know, they haven't really, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're both supporting me. You know what I mean? And, um, I go on the back and like, you know, I, I just like, as soon as I put it down, I just go right to the back of the warm up room by myself. And I just kind of start crying and my mom, and my dad come back and stuff. And they both hug me, you know, probably like since I was like six or seven, I haven't gotten a hug from my parents together before that point, you know? So it was, uh, it was really, you know, it's a really, really cool thing. And I just remember cause my parents were both just like the, not that they didn't get the weightlifting, but it was just kind of something where it's like, you know, they're lifting heavy weights. It's dangerous and stuff, whatever. And, um, I just remember they were both just like, you're done, you're done. You don't have to do anymore. You don't have to do anymore. And I'm just like, well, I got one more attempt, <laughs> you know? And, um, so then I go back out there and I load the 755 that, uh, I, uh, I missed in that previous meet and, um, I rip it right up, man. And seven twenty or twenty twenty two, mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I finished the meet at eight for eight. You know, I, I didn't take that third bench, but I mean, eight for eight, I mean, it's, it's a perfect meet. Yeah, yeah. You know what for, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Ish. Uh, ish. And um, <sighs> I just remember, man, like it was like, I was so stoked and I was so happy. And and I remember all my friends were there, my mom and my dad were there and everybody was there. And it was like this, like, 
this like movie thing, right? Like everything I wanted, like this, it's in this cool setting. It's at the beach, you know what I mean? Like it's like this cool venue and there's a ton of people there. And it was like the biggest meet in Florida at the time. So like, it was really, really cool. And uh, I just remember I like, I went home and I was like really, really sore. <laughs> and um, it was like, but we just talked about it. It was like up until this point for a year, like it was like, and even like a little bit prior to that, like 2000 i just want 2000 like that'll be like my th- like I, mm-hmm. you know i just want to hit it i want to hit it and i get it and i'm just like man i mean i probably could do a little more <laughs> you know mm-hmm. or it's like it just like it didn't i woke up the next morning and there's this old guy that um i used to train with tom o'donnell bug man and um he was a he was an exterminator so they'll everyone at that, that gym they used to just they have nicknames for each other you know so he was bug man and uh i just remember he's like you know the one thing we're all guaranteed after a powerlifting meet is you got to go to work Monday. And I just remember I, I woke up and I went to work and nothing was different. <laughs> you know, it's like, I put all this, this emphasis on like hitting this number and like doing this and I, you build it up so much in your head and it's like, I did it. And you know, it life, life's still kind of the same deal. You know what I mean? But I, I still wanted to do more. It and, is. You know, I would say that, I mean, there's <clears throat> lifters go through different chapters. Yeah. I, I think that was where I think that started the next chapter that day. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it became so- more for you i felt like i was there like i finally yeah. felt like and i was a power lifter before you know what i mean yeah. like i was but i just felt like at that point it was like like 2000 in 2017 raw or you know whatever it, it was a big deal you know what i mean not a lot of people did it and i remember you know uh, powerlifting watch was was the ranking website at that point right and uh i would sit there and i'm like this with open powerlifting today i have it you know, i work from home and so i have a tab of open powerlifting on my computer all times so i look at that website every single day i look at those numbers every single day and i would do that with you know the the open powerlifting or the powerlifting mm-hmm. launch and i just remember like i was like the top 10 like to get in top 10 you'd have to have like a 2000 pound total or somewhere around there and that website was wasn't as accurate there was missing mm-hmm. numbers and stuff but like i just remember i was like if i can just get in that top 10 man like i feel like you know i'm like i'm a legit you know what i mean like i'm i'm part of it you know i'm i'm, I'm a contender you know whatever mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a legit guy once you get there and we talked about this the other day where it's like you get to this threshold and it's like i was you know maybe 10 or 11 or whatever the number was but everybody below you on that list you don't look at that anymore you mm-hmm. just look at everybody above and then i look at the top of that list and it's eric Lillybridge at the time and it's 2369 369 pounds is a big difference from 2000 oh yeah so i i you know you realize you're just like the number like you know i'm I, I'm, but there's still a lot left to do and i i want to push for that you know what i mean i want to i want to i want to be top five i want to be whatever and um so that kind of led into the next meet from there you know um well going back to that one with that 788 squat when it started to stall did you have the ability at that time to process what was going on or was it just fucking just keep grinding you know like when you get to that stick point and it's like no one probably can see it, but you feel like yeah. every like half centimeter you're moving up. So I knew I was getting it, but it was like, it was just kind of like that, like, keep going, keep going, keep right. going. So it wasn't where we were talking the other day yet. Yet. But okay. I, I remember as I was coming and this is, you know, like yeah. rookie kind of stuff. And I still kind of do this today sometimes, but like I was coming up and as I'm coming up, I was just like, yeah, I just yeah, let yeah, out yeah, a yeah. big roar. Right. Oh shit. Which is great. <laughs> Cause that's like, I was, you know, you're feeling the adrenaline, whatever. And I get all the way up. But now my air's all gone and I'm starting to fall forward. And I'm like, in my head, I'm just like, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And he says rack. And as soon as he says rack, I fall forward and they catch me and they put me, but you know, he mm, said the rack command. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's good at that point. But um, yeah, I just remember, I mean, I, I got the squat and I almost fucked it up just by, you know, being a, a showboaty kind of guy, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But um, yeah, so that, that, you know, and from that meet there, then, you know, that led into uh next one and I, I can keep rattling off all these meat well let's get to the to, let's get to the meat where you your biggest meat the mm-hmm. 20 what was it 2347 20, so yeah. that one so going into that meat and i'll kind of backtrack even just a little bit from there um so 2020 COVID happens right mm-hmm. everything shuts down um prior to that i had hit i had done two meets so i had done a meet in um i had done a meet in texas that was my first travel meet and I did a meet in, uh, Sarasota, 
so local, right? And so prior to that, my best numbers, I had a 2105 raw total, and then I had a 2204 wrap total. And so, you know, going from one to the other, it was like, I just had a hundred pound jump. So like you, mm. I'm, I'm going to do that again. You know what I mean? I can, I'm going to total 22 in, in sleeves. So I go to that sleeve meet and I hit a 21, 21, six for nine. You know what I mean? I got called high in a squat. It's the only time that's ever happened to me. And like, you know, again, I, I went, I came right up with the squat, but it's almost like you kick yourself. It's almost worse. I did it, but I didn't do it right. So it doesn't count. Right. With, with your squat style, how much do the wraps actually help? Um, I don't really know. Cause I mean, I've, so I'm doing a, a wrap meet coming up here, but I mean, I've calculated maybe 50 pounds, you know, from, from sleeve to wrap. But, um, I, I asked because you're wide and you sit back, right? right yeah. So, so it's more stop. It's more stopping power yeah. than anything. But I, even again, I mean, I had, uh, an ex-girlfriend at the time, wrap. You know what I mean, so that was who wrapped me, mm -hmm. and it was like she was wrapping me, but like she would set the wrap, and I would almost pull the tension out of it. So like I was really kind of like self wrapping, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So like I've really never had someone like really crank down on my knees. I don't think, and as far as like competition wise, so I mean we'll find out here in, mm -hmm. in April when I compete. But um, yeah, so I I did that meet, and the the twenty one twenty one was in sleeves, right? And so I squatted uh, eight twenty one. I missed uh, eight forty eight on on depth. And I benched 529, had a great meet, and then I went one for three on pulls and shit the bed really bad on pulls. Back pump, I mean, I just, you know, couldn't do, couldn't do anything from there. I got my opener. And so from that meet, I went right into another wrap meet in uh, March. And um, so, again, my, my best numbers going into it was a 2204. And so I was like, well, I'm going to be in a monolith this time. I don't have to walk it out. Like, I'm going to hit something bigger. So I squat 903 at that meet, but my bench kind of dropped off a little bit lifted this too i missed my second bench so i had to retake it and then my deadlift i missed my third so i only got 804 so i went 903 518 804 so 2226 so these these two meets that i just did back to back i only added 20 pounds to my total you know what i mean and so in retrospect i mean like any progress any steps forward is good right mm -hmm. but in my head i'm just like man i'm like stalling out right now you know what i mean like i'm not like i need i need like a, a big jump and um so I, uh, we go into, we go into, you know, COVID lockdowns, whatever. Um, the girlfriend that I was with at the time we had broken up. And so I move in with, uh, Sean and Nick who were my coach and, uh, the gym owner, my, both my, my best friends. And, um, so I, I move in with them. We move all the gym equipment into their garage. I work from home. So literally I just got to go into training camp mode for like six <laughs> months. And so, so like, I know like uh, 2020 was a bad year for a lot of people, <laughs> but like 2020 was probably one of the best years of my life in that sense where like, you know, I am, I don't even know how old I am at that point, probably 26 or 27 or mm -hmm. something like that. But I'm just training, I'm working, I'm just doing whatever I want at that point. And I have this meet that's lined up, uh, the showdown meet, which is a big, big raw, mm -hmm. meet, raw only meet. And um, it was going to be in New York at one point. And so there was questions of whether or not be canceled because of all the lockdowns and so they moved it to kansas city and um so i go out to that meet and i have a lighter prep going into it but i was dialed in man like i was hitting everything so freaking fast and everything was confident and i just felt good you know what i mean like my deadlift had been lagging for a couple meets i was starting to pull it back up my squat felt really good and my bench which is always kind of like my weak point that it you know it was it was down from the last meet as well so that was starting to come back up and um you know, so I, I go into this, this meet in, uh, Kansas city and I knock it out of the park, dude. I have like, I go for eight for nine. I squat eight eighty one, I bench five thirty four, and I pull eight forty eight, and I total 22 65. So I go from a 21, 21 raw total and a 22, 26 wrap total all the way up to a 22 65. Right. So like, you know, big, big jumps mm -hmm. and everything else. And, um, from there I moved you know, after that meet, I kind of packed up all my stuff. I was, uh, I started dating this girl and we moved to Colorado and, um, I kind of, you know, I kind of got away from lifting for a little bit, you know what I mean? It was kind of one of those things where like in my head, like at that point, 2265 was number three all time, right? At raw 308 wrap, you know, sleeves. And, um, so like now it's like, it's like Eric Lillybridge, it's Larry, or it's Larry wheels, Eric Lillybridge and me. And so like in my head, I'm like, 
I can be okay with this. You know what I mean? I can put it down. And, you know, just even talking to you yesterday about just like, I feel like maybe it's a younger guy thing now, I guess, where it's like, we all have this like end game where it's like, I want to hit these numbers and I just want to be done and walk away and whatever. But it's like, I love this. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like, this is kind of like over the last seven, eight years, this has like become who I am. You know what I mean? Like, it's just something that, uh, I don't know. I, lo- I love it, man. It's I wake up every day and I'm like, I'm thinking about training or my whole day is routined up to, to sit there and prepare for a meet or, you know, whatever. And so I go up there to try and get away from and, uh, you know, just like start this whole new life and, you know, kind of get away from, you know, training. I'm in an, an environment and everything else like that. My family's all in Florida and stuff. And, you know, that doesn't work out you know, yeah. for very, for very long. Say, how long I mean? that work? And uh, mm-hmm. I'll tell you what was humbling about that is, you know, I, I have that meet. And then I go to train at a, a commercial gym up there. It's called like Vasa Fitness or whatever. It's like a crunch, right? Mm-hmm. And so they have all those sh- they have bumper plates and shitty bars. And so I go from squatting 880 there and pulling, you know, 848. And I go to that gym and it's in a tight little combo right, or a tight cage. I can't get my hands where I want them. So I got to get really inside. There's no knurling in the middle of the bar, right? And I remember I go to, I go to squat and I can't, you know, my hands are usually pretty wide. So I go to squat. I got two plates on there, man. And I, 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 it almost falls off my back. And I'm like apprehensive about squatting two plates. And I just, mm. I just squatted <laughs> almost 900 pounds <laughs> like two months prior, right? And so I do that. And then I go to deadlift and they don't have chalk or anything. Mm. And these bars, no knurling. I go to deadlift like maybe 600 or something like that. It slips right out of my hands. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, it, I mean, talk about like an ego check, man. I go from being... <laughs> feeling the strongest I've ever been. It's more, probably one of the strong, you know, strong yeah. people in the rankings. It's just like, I fucking don't feel comfortable squatting two plates and I can't even fucking hold on 600 pounds. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to the, the 2347, <laughs> but so this is all building up to it. And so, so I, I'm training at this gym, you know what I mean? I'm not really focused on training my nutrition, whatever. I probably get down to like, maybe like 280 from like just maybe. Did you think you were done at that point? I thought I was done, but like, it was one of these things where like, in the back of my head, it was like, I can always go back to this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If, if things don't work out with this girl or I don't want to be in Colorado, like I can go back to this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And lo and behold, things didn't work out with the girl and, and I ended up moving back to Florida. But like, it was another, I was just in the same situation where I had just gone through a breakup. I'm up in Colorado by myself. You know what I mean? I'm like, I feel like I'm like a man on the moon. You know what I mean? I have no real friends at the gym, but like, I don't want friends like i'm not having anyone over my house i'm not going out to get beers with anybody i'm just working i'm there's a gym up in brighton so i'm in downtown denver there's a gym in brighton it takes me about an hour to get there after work every day in traffic so i'm pissed every single time (laughs) i gotta drive up there right and and, um but uh though it, it put me back in that exact same spot i was in for the last year where i had just gone through a breakup i'm by myself I can just focus on what I want to do with training. I can make it what I want to fucking make it. And, uh, this is just, this is going to be my priority. I'm going to work mm-hmm. and I'm going to train. And in that year, like I said, 2020 was a great year for me from that, that transition from, I'm going to do this meet. The meet uh, it was perfect, man. I sit there and I go up to this gym. I found a great crew to train with training went phenomenal going into it. And, um, I'm already having these plans. Like I'm going to move back to, I'm going to move back to Florida a year to the day. You know, when my lease is up, I'm getting, mm-hmm. I'm getting in my car and I'm moving back to Florida, packing all my, my, my little apartment, my cat, in my front seat. And I'm, I'm going back. And, um, anyway, so I, uh, I go to this meet and I go seven for nine. So a little, a little worse than last year. But I squat nine Oh three fat, the best nine Oh three I've ever done. So I, in training, I had only done eight fifteen for a double, right? going into that meet and that 815 was the first 800 pound squat I'd had on my back since the 880 from last year. So I went 880 about a year, 815 and then I smoked 903 faster than I've ever done it. I mean to this day probably. And um I load up 925 is the is the all-time world record, right? Or 922 at the time. So I'm I chip a chips. So I just went right mm-hmm. up to 925. Uh miss it, but just the fact that I got to close out the flight at this huge meet, you know what I mean? And I, I attempted an all-time world record. Like I was like, this is awesome. Uh, I bench 540 and then I go out and I pull 859. So I totaled 2303. And um, for me, when I first got into lifting, you know, we were, we, we were talking about just like, you know, it's surreal for, for me to like sit there and kind of put myself in like 
in the same list as these people or you know same category even you know what i mean it's it's pretty uh i never look at it like that you know what i mean and when i first got into lifting there was this guy brandon allen who totaled 2303 at uh, a california meet mm-hmm. and it was like they had this cool youtube video about the thing and i just remember i was like that's what i want to be you know he's big beard mm-hmm. he had a fanny pack he, you know mm-hmm. he's just a meathead and i was just like that's that's what i want to be and um then i go to this meet and i i hit that 2303 man and for me that was like like you're strong that mm-hmm. number you know what I mean? that's a big number and um he was actually at that meet and i i remember i went up to him and i was just like hey man like i don't want to bug you or anything but you know i introduced myself and i'm just like i just want to let you know like when i first got onto lifting like you hit your 2303 total and it meant a lot to me just like to to aspire to be something like that or to sit there and get to that and um i just hit mine and you're here to watch it and for me to meet you mm-hmm. after i just did that after i looked up to you for so long surreal dude like it's like crazy you know what i mean and uh he was nothing but cool about it and you know we chit chatted and hung out the next day and stuff and um at that meet um i actually i met my girlfriend uh, she was she was living in california at the time and um i was living in colorado we you know i slid into her dms a couple times and stuff and we just kind of hit it off before the meet and uh we met at the meet and um really hit it off you know it's awesome and she she actually competed she was there to compete too she's strong as hell a thousand pound total at 132 400 200 400 and um so we hit it off so i helped handle her that next day and then uh we kind of parted our ways and then i moved to florida and then she moved to florida you know a couple months later right and um so leading into this 2347 now um you know, I talked about my best preps coming from, you know, when I go through these breakups. Well, I mean, I had my best, best prep when I actually had some to kind of mm-hmm. support me and get me through all this stuff. And so the meat prep was, was, I wouldn't say it wasn't the best prep going into the meat. I, I had missed a squat, uh, probably six weeks out that I probably shouldn't have, you know what I mean? I overshot a little bit and the two preps prior, I didn't miss a lift. I mean, like we had it dialed in where like, I didn't miss a lift and I'm kind of very mental that way where it's like, I kind of, snowball confidence right it's like everything's easy mm-hmm. easy 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 so all i know is easy by the time i get to the meet and um it's a squat i miss a bench that same week too five weeks out i i tear both of my thumbs because i'm a hook gripper and i i rip the whole thing i mean it's deep like mm-hmm. you know like, like someone just took a bite out of my thumbs and so for like two weeks i couldn't even like hold on to a bar you know what i mean so like i'm kind of shitting my pants a little bit going into this meet and um you know i go out there and uh you know, the, the meets in Miami, right? So it's hot as hell. The gym we're at's hot as hell. You know, I have uh, like one of these little like neck bands and stuff. Mm-hmm. I got a towel, I got a chair. Like I came like prepared, you know. And um, so I go out. I open at eight forty eight. I uh, I take a nine oh three on my second, and then I load that nine twenty five again that uh, that I had missed. You know, the meet prior, and um, I you know in my head I kind of initially I was like back in uh, the previous meet i was like you know i missed it this meet but it's going to be there next time and i was confident about it the whole time until i had missed that squat six weeks out probably i was just like you know it, i felt like it was like not like owed to me but it's like i'm going to get this squat you know what mm-hmm. i mean like it's just going to happen and then at that point it was kind of like a kick in the in the balls where i was like well maybe i'm not going to get this squat so i they, they load the bar up and stuff and at this meet i'm competing with uh dan bell he goes out and probably squatted like 1080 that day uh, Pat McGuire, who's a super strong guy from up in New England, he squatted 1014 that day. Uh, my training partner, Craig Foster, squatted 1025 that day. You know what I mean? So in my head a little bit too, it's like, I'm already pretty fucking far behind these guys, so I better get this squat. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And uh, it was a very, um, I don't know, it was a very out-of-body experience. I remember kind of going up and I was like, ah, you know, I'm kind of, the last one didn't move. As, the, the 903 I did wasn't as fast as the 903 I did in the meet prior. So it's like, ah, you know, that wasn't, wasn't as fast, but you know, it's already loaded and you're going to, you know, you're, you, gotta, you gotta go out there and do it. Right. And I just see all these guys smoke their squats and I was like, I gotta go out there and fucking do mm-hmm. this thing. And the crowd was a ton of people in there and it was, however the building was set up, it was loud. And I go out there and I load it up and you, you kind of just go white for a little bit. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? All you're doing is feeling it. You're just, you take it out of the rack. You're feeling that weight. You're going down. Same thing. I come up, I'm just stalling just a little bit, but it's creeping. You know what I mean? You can almost feel that like in your hips. Mm-hmm. I feel like sometimes like it's just like centimeter by centimeter. I'm just creeping. I'm creeping. 
same thing. I'm coming up. I just, I knew what's going and I just let out a big, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, enough air to sit there and not fall mm -hmm. forward, lock it out. They rack it and three white lights, man. And I, I get that squat. And, um, it was, you know, talking all the way back to, like I said, 2016, where I'm just looking at this, this board, you know what I mean? Of just like these, these, these rankings of just mm -hmm. like these guys and stuff. And, uh, you know, I just hit an all time world record squat. You know what I mean? I'm, it was Rob Phillips' squat, who was, you know, somebody I looked up to. He was a huge squatter. You know what I mean? It was Eric Lillybridge's squat before that. And the record had stood for maybe like five or six years. And I mean, in powerlifting, if something stands for more than a year, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, anymore. Kind of, yeah. it's pretty legit. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was pretty awesome, man. And then I go out, you know, so I'm fired up from that. I'm like, I'm yelling and, you know, all the stuff in the back room. I calm down a little bit. We go to bench and, um, my bench had been moving prior to that, but I mean, it was like five pounds, five pounds, mm -hmm. five pounds. And, um, so I go out this, this, I blow up five Oh seven fast, five forty on a second. It's a five pound PR. And, uh, I always try and just do like a five pound PR in a second. You know what I mean? If there's more, you can get more. If not, you know, you're, you're probably right about there. And, uh, so I blow the five forty up and then we load, uh, or five forty five. I'm sorry. And uh, then I load 556 and I get it. And I get a 16 pound bench PR. I don't think I had ever done that. You know, I hadn't done that since I was like two years in maybe or something mm -hmm. like that. So it was a big, big deal. And then at this point, I'm adding up the numbers and it's like, we we'll pull 892. That's, that's the all time world record total. That is the number one spot mm -hmm. on this list. This is, that's, you know, to, and then in your head, it's like, you know, you don't want to think too much into it because you don't want to yeah. fuck it up or whatever. But, um so i'm warming up and warm-ups are going good this little callus on my pinky right here starts peeling out but hook grip you're really here this this mm -hmm. finger's kind of just chilling away so this you know if this rips it's not a big big deal so i go out i open 815 fast and that that secures me the win for the meet too and that's my first big big you know best lifter win at one of these pro meets where you know best first place is like five fifty five hundred dollars or mm -hmm. something like that so i'm just like you know that that locked that up right so then I put 865 as a second, and that's going to be a five, six pound deadlift PR, but that's going to put me at 2347. So I go out there, I rip it right up, and then it's like, I wasn't that hard, you know? And I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm there, you know what I mean? 892, this is, this is the total record. And um, so then I go back out and I get all fired up for it, and uh, I go to pull 892, and it's just, you know, I slack it all out and I go and I rip it, and it's just glued. And I was just like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's all right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. um, that, and that's 23, 2347, man. And like I said, eight for nine day, best lifter at the meet. Uh, at the time, it was probably 11, 11th best raw total ever, regardless of weight class. And like you look at that, that, that list, all those guys are like 350 to 380, 400 pounds. You know what I mean? So if I'm just like in the ballpark of those dudes, like I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah and then it immediately again it's it's really cool for about five ten minutes and then you're just like well, I could, you know yeah I, I do a little more here and um you know just kind of leading from there i uh I, I signed up for a meet the american pro last year it was the first year they had it i was probably like the second or third guy to, to sign up um i had talked to micah about the meet i remember i was coming back from the gym one day and uh I, he calls me up and like we talk on the phone i've never talked to this guy in my life we probably mm -hmm. talk on the phone for 30 minutes and we're hyping up this meet and how great it is and what his vision is for it and stuff i'm just like i'm sold and i sign up for it in december before i even get through this meet you know what i mean that's if mm -hmm. i can give a tip to anybody don't sign up for another meet until you get through the one that yeah yeah, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're already end up with the car <laughs> for the horse but um so i sign up for this meet and uh take it a little easy for a week or two and i try and go right back into prep but I had just done this 2303 total. I had just done this 2347. And it's like kind of catching up to me now. You know, I take I took a year off prior to that, which is the longest break I had ever taken. But you know, it was catching up to me at this point mm -hmm. now. Back to back meets. And so I I'm trying to prep for this meet and maybe like 16 weeks out, like I have a, a strained UCL in my uh my elbow, which is like the same thing the guys get Tommy John surgery for. Mm -hmm. Benching's a bitch. I can't get under a squat bar. And a lot of it was stemmed from just shoulder immobility I had had. So like, you know, once I, once I addressed this, this went away, uh, I had a back injury that kind of flared up, you know, that with, with the herniated disc, they flare up maybe once or twice mm -hmm. a year, if I'm not really cognizant of everything. So just all the, the wear and tear from those two meets kind of caught up to me. And, um, 
So I had to pull out of the meet and that was probably the first time uh, I'd ever pulled out of a meet after signing up for one. And I kind of felt it was, it was kind of a shitty feeling. Cause I remember uh, listening to something you said where it's like, you, you know, the difference between powerlifting and other sports is like, you have a deadline. Mm-hmm. Like when I sign up for this hell or high water, I got to show up to the meet. I got to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? And so I kind of felt like, you know, kind of like a puss about it where it was like, you know, 16 weeks out, if I can't train, like, it's like, you know, it's enough time to where I can reasonably pull out of the meet and it's whatever. But, you know, I still felt mm-hmm. like shit about it. And then um, I, I signed up for this other meet in October of getting canceled but again it was something where like i was still banged up at that point too and uh i ended up pulling out of you know so mm-hmm. i was gonna end up pulling out of that meet anyway but it got canceled so it worked out and then uh that leads to the meet i just did in april so we're probably like in july or august yeah. of, of uh last year and i go i got like nine eight nine months to kind of gear up and prep for this right to walk out me it's back i haven't done a walkout meet in you know since 29 29- at this point you know what i mean everything's been in a monolift all my big squats have been in a monolift so it took a little bit of time you know kind of rehabbing that back i was kind of gingerly going back into everything i ended up switching over to sumo deadlifting because that didn't hurt my back as much and um i was able to kind of train that way actually you know uh seth albert albertsworth mm-hmm. he um he he, had, he was my pt at the time and he was kind of helping me through this stuff and so he had kind of encouraged me to kind of switch over to that and um so i, I you know it was i feel like a year later i'm still trying to figure that out i mean mm-hmm. that's like it's it's not no grip and rip it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot more <laughs> a lot more finesse that goes into that but um so i uh i sign up for that meet and you know prep kind of goes pretty good same thing as last the, the the prep prior to that where i miss a squat you know six weeks out you know i was, I was gonna go for four and i'm only getting three i missed the squat to so re regage everything and stuff and um I felt about as good as I could kind of going into the meet. I remember listening to something that Dave, Dave Hoff said where he felt like when he did that 3000, you know, he had, he had had a meet leading up to it. So it kind of teed him up to hit that Mm -hmm. 3000. Right. And so at this point for this meet, this would be like a 14 month layoff from competing. And that's the longest I've ever gone, not competing Mm -hmm. ever. Right. And so I was able to, you know, I went to the meet travel for the meet was not, ideal in any way where we um fly out there we have a connecting flight there's a bunch of storms in in texas that 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 weekend and uh, the meet's going to be in south padre island so it's like basically it's like 10 minutes from mexico basically Mm. like we're down there and so we have a connecting flight in uh in austin and um basically we missed our connecting flight by about like 20 minutes or something like that and this is the day before weigh-ins and so I finagle the rental car thing and I get it switched over. So I can't get my bag because the bag is still on the plane and it's going to take three or four hours to get it off the plane. So they said we can just meet the bag in, in you know, South Padre Island or whatever. So down that way. And um, so I rearranged the rental cars. We drive what, what would have been a 30 minute flight turned into a five hour car ride <laughs> that I'm driving through this crazy storm. I don't have my bag. And that's like, if you're mm-hmm. a lifter and you're traveling, like I have my gym stuff, but I'm trying to, like, I was telling you, like I went from 318 to 303 that for, for the coefficient, like in my head, I'm like, I want to hit a 2403 total. If I do that at 303, you know, all these yeah. powerlifting math, it's a 600 dots. That's a good, that's a good mm-hmm. coefficient. That puts me like somewhere in the top 10 all time or whatever. And, um, and you know, it didn't end up paying it out anyway, but, that bag has my scale that bag has my gear for the meat and like i'm just like i need i can't not have this stuff for Mm -hmm. the meat you know and um so we we get to the airport down that way uh i'm waiting for my bag till midnight the you know to get the stuff i'm there i haven't eaten anything finally check the scale i'm like 304 so like i'm right on where i need to be we drive to weigh-ins we weigh in we're all good to go and um honestly like leading into the meet like i felt very good in the sense like we were staying at a giant airbnb there was i mean it was like the last couple i've I've done a bunch of meets with dan dan bell and his wife always coolest airbnbs for us all to stay at so it's like we kind of just like tag along with them and they're like the biggest fridge i assume fridge i mean (laughs) you know beds the whole deal man like you know i'll sleep and kind of whatever but like these are like nice spots and um so he's staying there, Shane Hunt's staying mm-hmm. there, uh, 
death grip Derek is you know he's staying at a hotel down the road he comes over to hang out and it's like there's a bunch of like all these like big name lifters we're all hanging out in this one house we're growing up steaks the night before and I, I tried to re recomp as much as I could so I mean I felt I probably drank like two gallons of water that day I was eating like every couple hours like I had a belly out to here so I was like 315 by the time I went yeah. to bed so I recomp pretty good but it was probably the most I've ever tried to force food back into my you know my system and I just remember I woke up at like I don't know, three or four a.m. the night before the meet because I never really sleep good the night before. It's like Christmas, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you can't really sleep; you mm -hmm. just want to get there. And I remember I woke up at like three or four a.m. and the belly hadn't gone away, and I was just like, "This needs." And I felt like crampy, and I felt mm -hmm. bloated, and I was like, "This needs to clear up like soon." And um, so we end up, you know, we go to the meet. Uh, I squat nine hundred three on my second, so I go eight forty eight, nine hundred three, and then I load up uh, nine twenty eight. And I, you know, I come up out of the hole. I'm halfway there. I'm just kind of grinding, grinding, grinding. Don't get it. And, um, you know, I feel like I, I took that a little bit better than, you know, I didn't fit or anything. Like that, yeah, but yeah. I just, I walked in the back. I was like, I just wasn't, wasn't there. I wasn't strong enough to go. That was heavy. But, um, you know, it, it's my record. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not like I like lose the record because I didn't re-break mm -hmm. the record. But it was still kind of like a shitty feeling. And then, um we go to bench. I open at 523 and my bench had felt the best the entire training at a squat bench deadlift. My bench is my worst lift and that felt the best. All the numbers were great. Everything was huge. And uh you know, I go out there, I open at 523, flew off my chest. And then I load 562, which is a 5 pounds PR, which is my typical kind of mm -hmm. move. I just move all my openers and uh my seconds kind of up from what they were the last meet and uh as soon as I take it out both of my feet kind of like slide like it's not carpet like it is here it's like those horse mats so my feet kind of slide so my arch goes right away and um you know it's not an even excuse but it's you yeah know. i know i get it. and um so come right up and it was kind of right at that spot where it's a little too far forward and i'm starting to flare and i don't want to push too much and kind of waste my kind of knew the lift was gone at that yeah, point so yeah. i was like just take it go for a second and i miss it and i'm just like i'm one for three on bench and i'm just like all right so like in my head now like it was like i missed that squat and i was like well i can still you're doing all the math. I'm like, I can still get the 2375. That's that was the, that would have been the total mm -hmm. record at that point. And uh, I was like, if I tweak this, do that, I can still get there. And then I missed that bench, and it's just like, all right, well now I just need to salvage this fucking meat, man. You know what <laughs> I mean? And um, so I go out to open on deadlift, six, and uh, I, you know, I did like the typical sumo kind of goof where like I get all the way up to the top, but the whip got the best of me, and I'm just trying to hold it. Hold. I feel like I'm tipping forward on my toes, right? I'm just like, hold it, hold it, hold it, give me the down. And I just, I go forward before he says down. So it doesn't count. I finally set the second one. I, I set it up right, rip it right up, easy. And then uh, I, I, I'm i looking at my phone and I was like, well, that's a 23, or it's 22, 54 total. And I was like, okay, well, what's, what's, what do I do? 23. Cause like, you know, if I get 22, 54, like that's a good number. But for, I'm like embarrassed if I mm -hmm. hit that number. You know what I mean? That's like a four for nine day or something like that mm -hmm. if I miss this last deadlift. So we put 876 on there, which I had missed in training probably five months prior when I was trying to just kind of feel out some sumo numbers. I had done 826 and I loaded 870 and the same thing. My technique wasn't there. I just pitched right over and stuff. So we load 876 and uh, I slack it and I, I just remember just to my knees and I was just like, fuck, you could have done 903 today. And mm -hmm. I just I finished that lift. I get it. I let out a big yell. 2303, five for nine day. I still, if I would have hit all my numbers and had a perfect day, I would have placed the exact same at the meet. I would have got the exact same amount of money. So it really didn't make a huge, huge difference. But for me, I was just like, I go from the year prior, 2303 is like everything, like super stoked about it to 2303 of me. And I'm just like, man, like embarrassed. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like five for nine is the worst, worst meet I've ever had as far as attempts wise. And I've never, up until that point, I've never not totaled my PR. You know what I mean? Every single meet, it's, it's at least 20 pounds, at least five pounds. You know what I mean? I, I get something on my total. This one's the first time I go backwards. And I, you know, I talked to you about it yesterday. You know what I mean? I, for a couple weeks, it like, it sat with me really bad. And I mean, I signed up for a meet, you know, that Monday. I was, my, buddy's, my buddy's putting a meet on. I was like, you know, I was going to take a break after this meet and everything. And I was like, after that, I was like, I came home, I gave it like a day, two days. I wrote out however many weeks out it was, 36 weeks of like, you're building to this. And I've, I talked to my buddy, I'm like, you're doing this meet in December? 
I'm signing up for this. I was the first person to sign up for it. It's December 9th or 10th in uh, Sarasota. It's going to be King of the Platform put on by Jordan Wong. And um, I mean, it, it, now it's just kind of, you know, now we're building to it again. You know what I mean? I'm addressing the little things that I need to kind of fix to, uh, to, to set up. But like we were talking about teeing up that total. I got that 2303 now. I'm not beat up. I'm not, nothing's injured. And now I'm just going right back into a volume phase where all my volume numbers are much higher than they were last time. You know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're, they're all time volume PRs. And I know it's kind of like a, a goofy little, you know, PR PR, but like, that's how I kind of gauge where I'm at. You know what I mean? Well, it's your work capacity because, you know, I'm listening to you and you said that, um, you, you didn't compete for 14 months. Mm -hmm. Right. And it sounds like to some people that that would be like a, a really decent off season just to like chill, let everything fucking recuperate and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you pulled out of two meets during that time because you were too fucked up. Right. So it wasn't like you had 14 months break. It wasn't vacation. It was hell like, no. no. It was yeah. worse. Yeah. It was way worse. Yeah. You know, so the 14 way could have been amazing, mm -hmm. but it wasn't no. because it was just compounding where God, what I would have hated to hear is like, you got to meet in a month. No. You know, it's like, yeah. you, you, that should be like the, the warning sign. Mm -hmm. Like you need to, as you said earlier, you need to have like two meets a year. There has to be time. There has to be, you know, some phasic response to be able to get away, come back, get away, come back, yep. especially at the level that you're at now and, um, and avoid that other shit. It's a different game. Yeah. The numbers are bigger. Let's take a bathroom break real good, quick. Then I'm going to come back and we'll talk about your training for how it's evolved over the years. Perfect. As so I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are going to do really well usually don't. The ones that are going to do really well do really well either way they're all limited runs so it changes you know every single month but all limited edition items are tri-blend material with you know the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are the limited edition items directly support the podcast so head over pick up your shirt today could be a hoodie could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular. But you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over, over to the limited edition apparel. Link in the description box. All right, guys, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Merrick Health. If you've been following the podcast for a while, you'll know that Merrick was the first company to step up and help support the Table Talk podcast. You guys are selected Merrick for your telehealth platform needs, but it also tells me they're providing the service that you're all looking for. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So you go to the link in the description box. If there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel, that would be the panel that I personally get twice a year, but probably is more suggested to get that full panel once a year. That's checking everything. Optimal performance, longevity, health, hormones, you name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel. You don't need to have the full panel every single time you have blood. I get my blood work done on a quarterly basis. So once a year, there's a full panel. Sometimes there's even more than that. And then there's the checkup panel, which is gonna be every three or four months. With a guided optimization, you're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine your needs are, what you're looking for. Anything to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment like you would have if you go to see your physician now. So the discount code again is Table Talk. The link is in the description box. Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. It is October 20 and 21, Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that 
links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning. Uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's, I don't know, I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium. A limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train and to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link option. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. Yeah. Okay, we're back. What I want to do here is, and I was trying to think about how I wanted to ask this, <clears throat> is when when I was speaking to you over the weekend, you have a, you have a lot of this shit figured out. Mm. More of it figured out than probably what you think you have figured out. <laughs> and because there's technical aspects, of, there's the training aspects of the game. There's recovery aspects of the game. There's avoiding stupid shit, but then there's also doing stupid shit. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of all falls in there. And a lot of people, and you're not that far removed from this either. A lot of people get very confused when they come into the sport, even intermediates in the sport, because there's a lot of positioning mm -hmm. amongst coaches on how they present their material because they're marketing too. Mm -hmm. So this has got to be better than do this this is stupid so it creates it creates a, a lot of confusion for people coming up but what the people coming up don't understand and i feel like i'm like yelling into a hurricane about this they need to look for the 90 percent that's common yeah. amongst all these people but that gets <laughs> blinded to the 10 percent that people are trying to leverage mm -hmm. to be able to get more clients or whatever reason they're that mm -hmm. and now because of that is why you find all these different variations and confusion and all that kind of shit but the the basic shit's the basic shit right. that you figure out like you need some like you said you have 36 weeks kind of mat. you need some type of long-term plan structure or structure then you have to have some kind of structure to be able to regulate what you're doing on the day-to-day week-to-week basic some kind of metrics mm -hmm. to follow you have to have the confidence to be able to know what you really need to hit in the gym where to me i agree with what you're saying the bigger variance between your training max and competitive max the better right right because it's less wear and tear especially when you're squatting 900 fucking pounds <laughs> yeah. you know you got to recover from that shit and um that gets lost a lot and let's and instead of saying how did you come about finding that let's you have let's just talk about the 36 weeks that you mapped out because mm -hmm. that may be enough for people to 
kind of what's going on. So the meat's over. You realize from the meat after being pissed or what, once you can actually think it through, yeah. which may be a day, a week, whatever it is. Then it's like, okay, here's what needs to be addressed, right? Recovery, obviously, all that other kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. then here's what the big thing is. So what does that look like? What's that conversation look like in your head before you even start putting things down? So for me, I think it's, you know, like I said, Sean has been my coach, basically my entire, you know, the mm -hmm. entirety of my powerlifting career. He's brought me from an 18, 47 pound total up to a 23, 47 pound total, you know, 500 pounds. And, um, he is so, he's so damn smart with this stuff where he, he has literally program to program of what we have done, you know, saved. So like he, he maps out the tonnage and he sees, you know, okay, well he gets hurt this week. Where was his tonnage at leading up to it? Where was his deloads at leading up to this? okay, well, let's, let's scale that back for the next time or let's tweak this going into it. So everything's very, it's calculated, you know what I mean? Like, you know, with RPE and everything else like that, where you go off feel and stuff, like I think those are great and they have their place. For me, I'm a very, uh, you know, creature of habit in the sense of like, I like to know I'm doing something and like I have like the proof behind it that like it's going to back it, you know what I'm saying? So like looking at other preps and everything else like that where we can kind of gauge like, you know, like it, talking about that one meet I did in 2020, I think the heaviest squat I had done leading in was like a 788 for a double. And that was a PR at that point, but I didn't even squat 800 pounds leading into that meet. And then prior to that, maybe it was like 750 or something like that. I used some accommodating resistance mm -hmm. prior, you know, 727 with some bands, light bands, you know, but, um, you kind of just have like a range of like, you know, like you're hitting numbers at this point so far out, but like, it's like, you know how they feel, how they should feel. Um, so like, you know, when I'm talking about that 788 for a double, it was easy, maybe an RP seven or something like that. You know, I could have done maybe two or three more. So going into that meet, I go 804, 854, 880, you know, none of these numbers I had even touched in prep, but I was so confident going into it that, okay, so next time I'm going to peak, you know, if I want to hit 903, so let's maybe bump it up the, that number that eight, 788 might've been undershooting a little bit. Let's go 815, right? And so that 815, like I said, it's the first time I had had that on my back leading up to that point. You know what I mean, a year basically mm -hmm. from that 880, but it was so fast. I knew like I, I, I took it out. I knew how it moved. I knew how it felt. And it's like, so going into the competition, I opened at 826. So I hadn't even done my opener prior to that, but I knew how fast everything had felt that I hadn't missed anything, nothing like that, that, you know, all I'm used to doing is just blowing through these squats, right? And so it's like, I know where my max is. My max is 880. So I should still feel confident that I can squat 880 because I didn't squat 815 for a double the year that easy. And I just did that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I should be ahead. And um, so that's kind of how I, I kind of base everything is it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? The same kind of volume structures that I'm looking at, the, the, the five sets of eight or, you know, the anything kind of building up to it. I know that I typically need to have a very big volume base going in where I'm used to squatting and benching and deadlifting, you know, twice a week, typically squatting and deadlifting always on the same day. I always pull after um, I squat and, you know, based on where those numbers are at, I kind of just like, you're going to tweak reps. You're going to tweak sets and stuff like that. Just kind of based on where you feel you're at or, you know, what you've been working up to kind of leading up to that point. But it's all calculated in the sense I'm looking back at previous programs. So it's like, uh, the last meet I had just done in April. Right. So I, had, I went all the way up to, uh, five sets of eight with 600 or 606. And then I did four sets of 10 with 628. So that's, that was the end of my volume block last time. And so, Saturday, I just did 645 for five sets of eight. I wanted to maybe go four sets of 10, but like, I didn't feel like I need to do tens right now. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I can gauge based off of where those eights are at. Like, I feel very good. I feel very fast. Nothing feels difficult. You know what I'm saying? I'm not banged up right now. So kind of going into it, when I shipped over, this next block is going to be kind of like a strength block, right? So I'm pull those five sets of eight. I'm going to go down to four sixes and I'll pick about the range where I started last time I ran this through. So like right around like 672, somewhere around there. And then we're just going to kind of go up every week and I know where I kind of want to finish, but like it's, 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 I think that's the hardest part with, uh, a, a, being a newer lifter is being brutally honest with you about where being brutally honest with yourself about where your training's at, how things feel. We all want to keep progressing week to week.
week. But if you don't feel like, like if you, if you did something, you know, for, I don't know, like four sets of five or something like that, and it didn't feel very easy. Maybe you shouldn't go up to that point. You know what I mean? Maybe you need to pivot a little bit or kind of stay at that same weight. Cause it's like your body's going to get that same stimulus 10 or 15 pounds lower than you would if you go up. So yeah. if mm-hmm. I'm looking at like a 660 squat versus a 683, if I do the 660 much faster than the 683, my body's going to get the same st- difference. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. it's all building kind of, kind of up to it. So a lot of it's just based on just previous programs I've run. And, um, you know, I think like, you know, we're joking about like the volume guy stuff or whatever. And like a lot of people like, you know, I don't want to say you can't hand, like you can't do that kind of volume, but people aren't just used to doing it. It's all I've done for the last six. No, they got to build into it. Yeah. So it's like, I, I just know like where, wherever I'm at kind of number wise, as long as it feels fast, it looks fast. And it's like, you know, I'm within a range of where I am in previous preps. I'm in a good spot, you know, so bench is feeling really great right now. My pull sumo is still kind of like a, uh, that, that, that part's hard because I don't really have a lot of data to go off of. So like previous to that, I had done strictly conventional leading up to it. And my, my deadlifts are a little different from the bench and the, the squat, very, you know, programming in the sense that like those typically run about the same. Like if I'm doing the same reps on bench, I'll do probably do the same rep ranges on, uh, on, on my deadlift or my bench and my squat reps are going to be about the same set wise and everything else like that. But deadlift, it's a little different. I have to peak that a little sooner than, um, you know, the other two. My last lift is going to be probably a week after or before those. Um, and the ranges of reps, I don't probably do more than like, I think fours and fives are like, that's like, that would be like a set of 10 for me on deadlift. Like I don't do yeah. very many reps on deadlift, but I'll do a lot of sets. So like uh, leading into this, like I had been doing a bunch of uh, bead works, so like 12 triples and stuff like that, you know, every 90 seconds. And I wanted to keep that same rep range when I kind of went into my volume work. So I'm, I'm in shape from doing all those, those 12 sets. So by the time I go into my volume work, if I'm doing like maybe eight sets of five or four, well, that's, that's less sets. So like in my mind, I'm like, this is easier. You know what I'm saying? They're not necessarily timed. It's a little more on my speed. So I can just focus more on the technique and kind of getting the, the, the reps done. But the volume of the total volume of reps is what I'm at. So if I can, like I said, keep it in that. 40 35 30 ish range on deadlift kind of going in squat and bench i'm going to be somewhere around like 40 ish total reps and then by the time i go into my strength block i'm going to cut that down to maybe like somewhere between 30 and 20. all right so when you're when you're working in your volume block <clears throat> are you looking at the workload as well like the tonnage or are you just looking at the total number of reps typically so like when when sean's been doing the programming he'll look at the total volume you know, week to week and everything else like that. And that way we kind of mitigate when I need to deload and everything else. When I'm doing it, I'm kind of more so going off a of feel right now. So this will be the first time I've, I've self programmed, yeah. I guess you can say. So like, and I've talked to him about that and everything. And it's, I think it's kind of one of those weird things too, where it's like, when you talk to a coach, when you're not going to, you know, I kind of want to do this by myself and stuff. And um, you're worried about how they're going to react or whatever. And he was just like, well, man, you know, it's kind of like the point, you know what I mean? Like I, as a coach, I want to teach you the information. I want you to sit there and know, it yourself and like it's kind of like let baby bird out of the nest and see if you can fly kind of deal so like you know in that sense it's a little stressful kind of doing it myself now but um so for me i'm not going to have necessarily like the same you know stat calculator he is, has a graph that mar- you know measures all the tonnage and everything else like that but i still know what typical reps mm-hmm. i need to kind of be in and the weights that i need to be kind of working at you know as far out as i am so um well the reason i ask is because if it's you know five sets of eight which you did you know and then- and you the weight and you multiply that all out even if it doesn't feel right at the five sets of eight Mm -hmm. you know it can it can always be lighter weight for six sets of eight right you know to bring it that way you still have that work because it's a fucking volume block right yeah it's it's for work capacity and, and volume and so forth and i think with a lot of lifters they get that fucked up mm-hmm. where they may push the weight too hard and this is the last block you want to really worry about pushing the trying to impress anybody no right? exactly you know, it's, exactly because it's more about the, getting the reps and getting the sets and yeah. all that um the only variant the only difference i'm hearing is for the deadlift the reps are lower but the sets are going to be higher so right. it still brings that back yeah into balance what about the bench for the volume block so bench wise i mean um like even when I'm peaking and stuff, like I'll do a ton of reps and sets on bench. Like if I'm doing like a, you know, if a typical, like a heavy-ish day or whatever, if I'm peaking 
be somewhere around like 10 total sets. So if I'm going to do a top double, triple, somewhere around there, maybe do like five or, you know, five or four sets of back off work. And then I'm going into my secondary, which is either going to be a close grip, close grip variation, some board work, maybe some bands or something like that to kind of work on that lockout, which is my weak spot. So that'll probably be somewhere around like, you know, 10, 11, 12 reps or sets. And I do that twice a week. So then on my secondary day, it's strictly focusing on lockout. So it's all board press, close grip work. And I can push my, my bench volume probably the highest out of the three. Um, mentally, it's probably just because it's like I said, it's my, it's my lightest lift, my weakest lift. Mm-hmm. But um, that seems to be the one I can kind of recover from. But it's still kind of walking that tightrope of like, like I said, last prep, I felt like it was maybe the, the, the strongest I had felt in my rep sets, my four by fours and stuff going into it were just light years ahead of where I was in previous preps. And then even going through the whole meat prep, I felt, felt good. And, you know, looking at it, I hit, um, going into that, that 2347 meat, I hit 501 for a double, which was a PR most I've ever done in the gym. And then I go out and do 556 at the meet. So like, you know, if everything's kind of adding up, I'm like, well, you know, maybe 518 for a double would be, you know, a good spot to, to end. And then maybe I go to the meet and hit, like I said, 562, 573 if I'm feeling really good. And uh, obviously, like I said, everything kind of happened where at the last meet where I didn't hit those numbers. So like now kind of looking at it, I'm, I'm like, you know, maybe I got a little greedy on that last one. You know, maybe if I did 507, like I said, your body's not going to know the difference as, mm-hmm. as far as and we're talking 11 pounds. So it's really not a huge thing. But I think it's just that confidence aspect of just knowing that like I'm progressing. I did more than I did last time, but it doesn't have to be huge as long as it's moving fast. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of like, that's my intent. Like if I'm looking at everything, how did it move? Was the depth good? Did it, you know, it felt fine. Mm-hmm. It moved fast. Like, you know, it's more than I did last time. Just check it. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be super uh, more, you know, when you move into the strength block, then cause you, you started talking about it. Then I pulled you back into the volume block. So when you start moving into that, what does that look like as it builds through? So going into this next one, um, like I said, I've been doing five sets of eight. So I'm going to probably whittle that down to four sixes. It'll be four sixes, uh, five fours, five, four by fours and like four three. So it's, it's all going to kind of get down to probably like a four by four toward the end, kind of incrementally going up in weight. And um, I'm not necessarily doing as many, I'm, I'm pushing those numbers right now, but I'm not doing as much secondary work on those. Whereas like in prep, like I said, it's 10 sets, typically a, a session twice a week where now I'm just kind of trying to focus on just getting the, the, that, like I said, that four by four up that five sets of four, whatever it may be. I'm trying to get those numbers up. And then I have on my secondary day right now, I'm just doing straight lockout work. So I was doing, uh, floor presses with chains, uh, for sets of 12 kind of, you know, last block, this, this current block, I was doing uh, three sets of 10 pin presses with some bands on close grip. The next block I'm going into will just be straight close grip. And then once we actually get into peaking mode, then I'm going to be focusing really on like that two board, three board area, which is where I typically kind of flare out. I miss. So if I can kind of build that up here and then uh, just keep chugging along with the, uh, the bench volume, I think really it's, it's just knowing I don't need a overshoot. Like I just need do just a little bit more than what I did last time because I felt, like I said, phenomenally strong, right? What we, we benched yesterday, I felt really, really good on everything. That's the most reps of probably 405 I've ever done, 40 reps. And um, so I know I'm, I'm at a good spot, right? But I don't want to go too much over the line. I, do, I need to do enough just to stimulate but not, you know, overpeak mm-hmm. or over, overload myself here. So I think that's where another area people can get all fucked up no matter on how their programming is, is – me and you smoke 940 in the squat i mean mm-hmm. just fucking kill it there's 40 more pounds left that doesn't mean you have to change your training to adjust it to equal 980 yeah you know the way it was always explained to me is why not just kind of use the same weights again or just a little bit more and actually do the 980 that you could have hit that day no exactly because that's less wear and tear you know that you have to endure because it's kind of it's coming like the wear and tear is still fucking mm-hmm. coming right so you got to to be able to mitigate that moving through and i think that part's really hard because it's like i said it's it's that being brutally honest with yourself like you know if i only want to do like maybe five or ten more pounds on a on a pole or a bench or whatever it is like you don't need to do if you're doing 30 or 40 pounds more on all your working sets than you did the previous prep you're probably overshooting a little bit like if it feels easy or whatever it's fine but like i i, I think like i said i i'm very I rely a lot on like what I've done previously and just knowing like, okay, this is back 
actress. I need to stick with this. And it's even like I said, I've been doing this for maybe seven, seven years now competing. It's still kind of hard to sit there and like, you got to be, you know, I, I probably could do this or I could probably do that. Like I said, you know, like the 645 I did for the five sets of eight the other day felt good. I mean, I probably could have pushed that a little more, but it's like, it's just knowing that like, it's like, just reel it in a little bit. This is already like a big volume PR. This is already like mm -hmm. a good number. You don't have to get greedy with it, you know? And well, it's, that's just part of the game because there's going to be systemic fatigue that's going to over time too. Mm -hmm. So if you, you could have done more, but maybe you don't feel it until your peak block. Well, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's a shitty time for that to catch up, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it will catch up. What, once you get through the, the first two exercises, so your main thing, so you kind of explained it with the bench, with the, um, what, what do the accessories look like downhill from that? So typically I'm going to do, if it's a lower day, I'm going to probably, probably try and hit maybe three different movements and it's going to be like a lot of it's lighter stuff a lot of body weight stuff but like it's i've already smoked myself so much doing the main stuff right so if i'm doing the 645 for five sets of eight and then i go and do pause rdls afterward after that you know i'm already so like i'll do like walking lunges or i'll do you know hamstring curls or abs reverse hyper you know back sets, little little stuff but mm -hmm. like for big sets so maybe i'll do like two or three sets of like 25 that you know what i mean so a lot of it's blood flow and i'm i'm feeling pumped as hell afterward but it's like i've already done so much with the volume mm -hmm. that it's like i don't want to blow you know just keep drilling at it you know what i mean i could go and hit you know super heavy three sets of you know 10 on you know quad extensions or you know hamstring curls or whatever but it's like you know then i'm like super wrecked by the next time i gotta you know, I, yeah i squat every three days so it's like i gotta be somewhat recovered by the time i get back in and um you know, it's, it's funny, like I'm a training partner, Craig, and you know, he squats a thousand twenty five, you know what I mean? A hundred more pounds than I squat raw, you know what I mean? Just a belt and sleeves. And like, you'll come and it's funny when people come to watch us or, you know, come train with us or whatever. And like, we, we have these big, crazy sessions and stuff. And like, he's hitting, you know, mid eights for like sets of triples or whatever. And I'm somewhere close to that too. And then we go to our accessories and we're doing like, you know, body weight lunges or like you know we're doing like you know good mornings with like you know a kettlebell it's like it's almost like like pilates kind of stuff you know what i mean and it looks goofy you're like you know you're squatting all this weight and you're not really doing a whole lot afterward but it's like i've i've done enough in you know the main movements the secondaries and the, and the main stuff that like by the time i get to the accessories it's blood flow for me it's just getting a quick pump at least peaking wise you know what i'm saying yeah. like an off season you might want to push it a little bit harder because like you know you don't have anything specifically you need to peak for kind of if you're not recovered by the next session or whatever it's not going to build up you know, well your next session is also way sooner than most people's yeah so it's if what do all those sessions look like over a micro cycle so say i think you said every three days right yeah so that's nine days right mm -hmm. so that your week is nine days so let's just look at it that way so, so what does that look like squat wise typically i'm gonna be i'll train four days a week and uh so monday will be like a lighter bench day um you know whatever the sets are gonna end up being that day um you know main movement dairy and then hit my accessories and then i'll pull on tuesday and so typically like i said i'm always gonna squat first and then i go to pull so the same thing it's going to be at the meet and i know it kind of sounds a little backwards where in the sense it's like if it's like your main that that's my deadlift day but i'm always going to squat first because i want that pre-fatigue kind of mm -hmm. build up and so squats will be a little bit lighter you know it'll be maybe like uh four or five sets of three or something like that with a little bit of you know bands accommodating resistance just kind of heat aspect in and then i'll go right into my pulls um top set and then maybe you hit like four or five back off triples or something like that then i go into my accessories i'll bench again on thursday and then that'll typically be my heavier day and um you know that's the same thing main movement secondary and go into my accessories and then we squat on saturday saturday morning ish so i get a bigger break in between the heavy and the light session so like i go sunday or it'll be a sunday monday and then tuesday i have the tuesday and then wednesday thursday friday so i get three days off between deadlift and squat to kind of recover mm -hmm. a little bit more for that but um you know typically i'll kind of run i'll run all that through but everything is weight wise is light you know what i mean for the you know relatively i mean like majority of the heavy stuff i do in prep is like right around 85 percent. you know what i mean i'll hang right between that 80 to 85 percent when i'm peaking and we just do a lot of doubles and triples maybe 
same weight every week. You know what I mean? Like if you're doing, I don't know, if I did like 770 for three, I'll go to 783 for three. And then maybe I'll go an extra rep the next time. That'll be three weeks worth. And then um, by the time we peak, we'll go from like an 87%, 85%. You hit 92 and a half one time. And that's that's the extent of my my prep. You know what I mean? It's just typically just under an opener. Uh, deadlift, I'll probably hit my opener for a single single squat and bench i'm hitting just under my opener for a double should typically feel like i have an extra rep in the tank and you want to just try and just smoke it fast you know what i mean like those are usually really really hype days because there's not a whole lot you know everything else gets scaled back your accessories get scaled back your secondaries your back downs and stuff so by the time you get to that those last top doubles and stuff like that like you're coming in you're hyped up they're quicker mm -hmm. sessions but like you know you just want to move it as fast as you can kind of going in as you progress through your and so you get into those sessions there do does your warm up become trimmed down? Um, warm up for that movement. So I would say everything kind of stays about the same. Um, as far as like just general kind of mobility, warm up stuff, everything's kind of the same. Um, I'm th more sets and reps of the squats, what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'll probably warm up just about the same. Right. You know what I mean? Plate, plate, plate kind of going up. The biggest thing is it's like we almost kind of look at like the top set as like a last warm up. Like I'm getting, I feel like I get my work done and my back offs because that's going to be like my five sets of whatever you know four sets or four reps or whatever like that and those are like i'm get that's where i'm getting stronger whereas like if i hit like a top triple or something like that it's only going to be right around 85 percent. you know it's nothing crazy mm -hmm. it's, it's weight that i've done for those reps and stuff before but like it's all building so like if i go if we're talking squat right so this last meet i squat 903 my last double was 843 and that was three weeks before and then prior to that, I had done uh, 788 for two triples. The week before that, I did 782 for a triple. And then the week before that was 770 for a triple. So it's like I'm staying within the same mm -hmm. range of weights, but I'm just I'm hitting it week after week after week. So like, I think that's where a lot of people would probably, I want to say feel stagnant with it, but it's like, I'm not progressing. I'm not hitting more weight every single week. I'm only going up 10 pounds or I'm only adding a rep, but it's like, I'm stimulating my body enough in the sense that like if I'm going with those weights, if I'm hitting them quick enough, you are building to that. You know what I'm saying? So like by the time I work up to that 843, all I've done is just like fast squats kind of going mm -hmm. up to it. You know what I'm saying? But then um, after like those triples, I do my back off work and that's where I'm getting a lot. Like I'll do, you know, four, four by threes or, you know, whatever else after the fact. And I feel like those are where I'm getting most of my work done. Um, and those will happen in the peak block as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that, so how many sets are you looking at? Say if you're three weeks out, so eh, say, yeah, say three weeks out. So one of your last heavy squat workouts, if not the last heaviest. So last heavy would be, um, it will just be that top double. And then like, there's, there's no, no pull, back there's off. no pulls afterward. There's nothing. So, you're, you're All right, so let's really, go the one before that one then. So the one before that I'll be, so I actually misspoke before. So the the one before that, I did 804 for three doubles. Mm -hmm. So I did three doubles, and then my back offs for that were very light. They were like 694 for three doubles too. So the reps okay. are getting pulled back, and the second yeah. are getting pulled back. But the week prior to that was it was a deload, and then that I was hitting 788 for three doubles, and then my back down sets were like four triples, and the weight was like 738. So it was still pretty challenging. You know what I mean? So everything kind of builds up to a certain point and then like maybe five weeks out are like the toughest sessions and then you start pulling them out, those back off, the reps. Back off sets. and then your top set, your last warm up, you know, that's what we kind of call it would be, those are getting heavy, but like you're kind of breezing through them, you know yeah, what I so mean? So you're actually starting the peaking process that in a way five weeks out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that would do what happens with the accessories there is. Those will definitely. It's still body weight shit though, so it's, it's probably what what does happen there. Just l uh, less reps. Yeah, it's gonna be um, on the lower body days for sure. It's less reps. I'm, I mean, I'll still on the upper body days. I'm hitting you know, yeah. you know, decent decent weight on some you know, uh, rows or you know tricep extensions, whatever those are gonna be like. I'm I'm gonna push it a little more on my upper body days, accessory wise, just because like I think I can recover. I I do recover a little bit better from those. Um, but on the lower body days, it's really just like everything starts getting just pulled back a little bit the closer you get to the meat. So even if I'm doing, um, you know, like say three weeks out, like I'm still going to have like typically the same stuff I'm doing accessory wise, but it's going to be a little less reps. You might end up pulling 
two of them out. So instead of doing four accessories, you're doing three. And a lot of it's really probably just like core and like reverse hyper just to make sure that my back's feeling good. You know, stability is going to be all set and everything else like that. But the majority of the work's going to be coming from the main lifts. What do you do in between the days for recovery? And is it always there? Uh, yeah. So that, I feel like that's probably um, that kind of stuff is really, I feel like, kind of taking my total um, far and above where it used to be. Where Work, like I said, the program typically stays about the same. If we know what works, we keep it. If something's not right, we we throw it out. But the program's typically about the same. The recovery stuff I've done in between, you know, I spend a lot of money on different stuff, whether it's it's Cairo, it's massage. Uh, I just started doing uh, cold plunge and, you know, hot saunas and stuff like that. Uh, MAT therapy I just started doing from after this April meet because I was talking to Blake LeHue and I was telling him about some back injuries I've had and he does that. And He's a really strong, you know, 181, you know what I mean? He's the best one in the world. So if he's doing that, I'm going to start doing that. You know what I mean? And I think that's kind of this, like, that's why I love kind of being around other people that are around that level. It's because it's like, you want to, we're all training hard. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We're all killing ourselves in the gym and doing what we need to do in there. But it's like, what are you doing outside of that? Like, what's, what little extra thing are you doing that I'm not doing that I could be tweaking my stuff on, you know? Um, I did a meet uh, at the end of 2017. I had a 2028 20, total and I was the only time I ever weighed in a super heavyweight. I was like 323 or something like that. It, I took about 10 months off in between that and I got a nutritionist and I got a CPAP. And I took less gear. I lost about 20 pounds and my total went up 100 pounds in wrap or in sleeves mm -hmm. from, from wraps. You know what I'm saying? So like the little things you do outside of the gym and it's like it's just the general preparedness. Are you doing mobility at home? You know what I mean? When you wake up, are you going for a walk? simple as a walk i can't tell you like that was something where i i probably slacked on that this last prep and i you know not that i was like out of shape but it's like you can tell the difference between like when you first start walking you're not used to it and you're just like you're huffing and puffing and like feeling like shit versus if you start just doing that consistently every day you can be at the gym and you're hitting your sets and you feel better in between your sets you're more recovered quicker in between your sets so it's like just general preparedness you know what i mean and i know it's like it's not like some groundbreaking thing but it's like if we're only in the gym gym a week for maybe three hours at a time that's 12 hours it's like mm -hmm. what are you doing the rest of the time are you sleeping are you you know CPAP like I I try if someone doesn't have a CPAP like I will sell you on a CPAP <laughs> that changed my life like I uh you know I used to work at Enterprise Rent-A-Car and I didn't have a CPAP so I would work um you know I would be there at 7 a.m I would work till 6 try and eat during the day I would go straight to the gym and I'd be there till maybe like 10 go home and it's like you're still jacked up from the mm -hmm. gym you're trying to eat all the food you missed out on during the day and then i go to bed and i'm only sleeping like four or five hours no cpap and then i'm going right back to work mm -hmm. and it's like you don't realize like you know i would be talking to customers and i would be falling asleep like while i'm talking to people i go sit in the car and i gotta get all the measurements mm -hmm. of like you know the the miles and the gas and i would fall asleep in the front seat and it's like <laughs> they'd have to wake it's embarrassing man yeah, you know yeah but um yeah when i got a cpap that like i mean it, changed my life i literally it added 100 pounds to my total <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just sleeping you know what i mean and um i don't know i, I feel like that's kind of like when we're talking about all in and it's like you know like even like these cold plunge things i'm doing and stuff like that doesn't feel good to go and sit in you know 35 degree water for rounds you know what i mean and then go into a sauna or whatever else but i feel like my recovery is getting better from that you know what i mean i feel like i've done cryotherapy i've done the, the, the cold hot you know contrast therapy and stuff it's like, you know, like a placebo deal. Like if, I, if I'm getting better from it, like then why the hell not? You know what I mean? Do like, you have, do you have any structure behind how you're implementing these or is it just kind of throwing shit against the wall team? With so sticks? typically I'll go to a PT like once a month, a uh, massage, like once a month. Um, the, the hot cold therapy I'm doing like once a week now. And, uh, you know, obviously a CPAPs like every single night yeah. and everything else like that. But it's definitely, it's something where like you kind of go in phases with it where it's, when you're you it's i feel like it's easy to get complacent so it's like you start like ah oh, maybe i don't need to warm up as much or i don't need to you know go on this walk i don't i don't prioritize it and then it's like you start kind of noticing or maybe you start getting a little dinged up or something like that if you haven't been to your pt if you haven't been getting adjusted and it's like those are like the little wake up calls where it's like all right i need to get back on my bullshit i need to sit there and do the stuff i need to do even just eating i mean like eat like i work from home so i, I work for an insurance company and uh, i'm an, uh, an underwriter and 
and sit at a computer all day. But it's like, for me, I feel like that's almost, it's a super boring job, but I feel like for me, it is as close to like being a professional power lifter as I can get. We're in the sense that like, all I do is I sit at home all day. I eat food. I drink water. I'm off my feet. I'm in air conditioning. You know what I mean? And then I'm just thinking about going to the gym all day. And then I go to the gym and train, you know what I mean? Versus where I've had, you know, you're, I've worked security jobs or I've worked like manual labor jobs. And it's like trying to go to the gym after that, after sweating already, and you want to go sweat more and tra- you're not fueled up. You're not, you know, prepared. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, as much as you can optimize the better. And it's like that the job I have, it's extreme. It's a boring job. It's not like I grew up wanting to be this underwriter for an insurance company, but it facilitates the life that I want to have, which is like, it's powerlifting is my, it's my priority right now. You know what I mean? And, um, I've kind of, you know, I've been at this job for about six years and, you know, about as long as powerlifting and it, it, you know, it facilitates what I want to do. It puts me in a position to be successful with, with my lifting and you to make sure I'm having good training sessions and I'm prepared to sit there and go to the gym. So. Um, one thing with, um, recovery modalities is uh, you're the guy, one of the, one of the authors of super training. And I say one of, cause it can be debated if it, cause it was Yuri Verkashansky and Mel Sif or all Yuri. There's, there were lawsuits about the shit. So I don't even know how I'm like, how, how I'm able to cite it, but anyhow, the guy we're training and fucking super intelligent when it comes to all this. And, I went down this rabbit hole of recovery modalities when I was mm-hmm. competing and he kind of helped guide me through this rabbit because it's a big fucking rabbit hole, you know, of all this kind of stuff. And one thing that he said to me, and it was during a conference that we were doing together at three o'clock in the morning or whatever. And he he said it's these modalities, you know, outside of nutrition and you know, stuff like mm-hmm. that, walking, crap like that. That's I was still training there. These modalities are like drugs, they're like steroids. Every now and again, you're going to find the steroid that works really good for you. Mm -hmm. Then the last thing you're going to do is take it all year. He says, you're going to take it. You're going to set it aside. You're just going to use that for the meats Mm -hmm. because that's when you really need it. Right. So the recovery modality is the same way. You know, so in the off season, dabble around, find the ones that really seem to help you recover, that really do help. Mm -hmm. Pull it, store it, use it when you need it for the meat because your body will adapt to them the same way it adapts. So if all you do is say MAT or all you do is one certain recovery modality over a period of time, it becomes less and less and less and less effective. effective. Your body adapts yeah. the same way it does to anything. But if it kicks ass coming out of the gate, right? So that fucked me all up too, right? Because if something did really well out of the gate, now I don't know if it's placebo or not. I don't fucking care either. Mm-hmm. And like, do I store this one? Or do I, how long do I know until I know? Right. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like we get like, <laughs> it's one of those things too, where it's like, you're, if you stop doing it or whatever, and it has been working, like it mentally, it'll, it'll fuck your training up. It's like, Oh yeah. God, I, I skipped my PT last week. Or like, you know, like something that I've been thinking is maybe sore is like, Oh, now it's really sore or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like mentally, like it's the same thing with my programming. Like I'm doing this program that I know works. Like I have it, you know, evidence based that it back, you know, backing it up that like, I will perform this way if I do this. And so I'm the same way with my nutrition, my sleep, my recovery and everything. It's like, if I know that I did this last, Last, well, I'm going to do it again. If I know I did this last, like, it's mm-hmm. like you, you want to try and like, I don't know, like recreate like what you've been doing. You know what I'm saying? Like to sit there and keep doing the same stuff over and over and over again. Um, now, I guess one caveat I need to put out there for those that are listening is if you feel like you always have to fall on to recovery modalities, then maybe you need to reassess your training. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they're just they could just be doing way too fucking much. Right. And they need to dial it back. But there still comes a point where you're going to need it to be especially in higher volume stuff that you're doing because yeah. <clears throat> well you know, there's there's joint soreness there's muscle soreness like the, the joint soreness becomes ah oh, fuck you know then you got to start what is it the training like what's going on right the muscle soreness is when you kind of click into okay listen i'm fell off i should be fucking walking you, you're not doing you you know what you're not doing right and, fucking calories aren't high enough hydrations you shouldn't be as sore as you are right you know and um that will change for actually now you're at the end of a volume phase so you probably shouldn't be getting very sore at all no i feel you know like i said even just you know i wasn't taking i was taking pretty good breaks in in between these these last sets and stuff but like kind of leading up to it like you know like i said i was doing the triples basically going into this the last block i was doing so everything was 90 seconds so i was feeling super conditioned so this time it was like I'm still trying to keep my rest periods nice and low, but like, I don't know. I just feel, I feel like I'm in very good shape right now. Nothing's too banged up or whatever. So 
So it's, it's almost like a good place to like just all right, cut it. Let's take a deload and then let's go into the next block feeling like if I feel great, like I don't want to get greedy with it. You know what I mean? Like this feels good. Let's move on to the next phase and keep plugging away, you know? So there was um when we put the post up on Instagram, Jordan Wong posted something about ask him about the whiteboard. Yeah. So is there a story behind that? Uh, so, I mean, I have, you know, like I said, I have, I have open powerlifting up on my computer all day and uh, I have this little whiteboard and I think, you know, it's like cheesy, like writing down your goals or whatever, but I have this little whiteboard that's, it's up in, you know, in between my, my two monitors. So it's, it's right here and it's got a list of every single meet I've done, the numbers I've hit at those meets, the dates, everything else like that, PRs, and then the goals I have for my next meet. And it's like, you know, literally I was talking about writing that program after the last one. Like I, you know, as soon as I came home, I updated the board. It really sucked to write 2303 on there. Like, cause it's, it's a lower number. Uh, uh, literally a track record of seven years of just only going up and now it hurt to write 2303 on that fucking board and um you know you you kind of thumb off whatever the, the numbers you wanted to hit this last meet you write the new ones and it's like like i'm committed to that now and it's like i'm gonna look at that every single day and it's like it kind of holds me like accountable you know what i mean like it, it's it's something that like you know I'm, I'm instilling in my mind like i will do this i have to do this i wrote it down kind of thing and like you know kind of i've done all my my entire powerlifting career i've had this this one whiteboard i mean it's like falling apart at this point you know what i mean i got it from like staples or something like mm -hmm. that but it's like it, it's like you know like my old crusty belt or something it's like a good luck charm like i have to if i'm gonna you know do do a meter or prep i have to have the board i have to sit there and write it on there and stuff and like you know when i took that break that 14 month break like i had to put the the board away for a little bit because it's like it almost was like you know i i'm not committed to like i can't look because i'm gonna if i if i have it up and i set it up like that's like a switch in my head like like it's time to get a little obsessed with it you know what i mean yeah. like i'm li i literally i'm looking at it all day and um you know it's it's kind of like my my weird little little way of just kind of like motivating myself i guess or just holding myself accountable like you know if i'm slacking like i said i'm not doing my walks or if i'm not doing my mobility or whatever and it's like you look at that and it's like well are you setting yourself up to be in a position to do these numbers you know what i mean and especially now having that like i said 303 on there like do you want to do that again do you want to sit there and undershoot what you what you sat there and put on the board because i mean for the majority part like you said i have everything pretty dialed in typically if i write it on there like i'm being honest with myself i know like what i'm capable of and um even even now i mean like it's like it's it's 10 more pounds on the squat i just did it's five more pounds on the bench than my best bench ever and it's like 10 more pounds on my deadlift i mean it's not very hard to and you know add but it to do it all on the same day and execute everything on the same day we, we were talking about that's the skill part it's not just being strong enough to hit these numbers these numbers i've been attempting my last two meets you know what i mean for the last two years i've been swinging for these numbers and i know i'm close you know what i mean i've held the bench in my hand that i need to hit for this total i've i've tugged at the, the weight that i need to sit there and pull and i've had the weight on my back that i need to squat and i've gotten damn close to all of them you know so it's not something that it's like this outlandish thing of like like well we all see people online that are like you know i just did this but now next meet i'm gonna do 150 pounds more or i'm gonna do this yeah. you know what i mean it's like i know it's close and i know i'm there but it's like it's just stacking enough chips in my favor with the walks the training the recovery you know enough i always sit there and say if i can sit there and string just a training day and then do another one and then another one and another one it's like for me mentally it's like if i only have had six months of good training days then it's like there's no reason for me not to perform at the meet. Like I've done everything I needed to sit there and do. And it's, you know, it's not, I wouldn't even say it's a confident thing, but it's just like, I know that like, if I've done this, like this will yield this result just based on the data that we have, you know, for seven years of competing and prepping and everything else. Well, I think it's, I'm a big believer in, you know, a vision board or, you know, writing down what you're wanted to do. And I don't like the word goal. I like the word objective. It's a whole different thing there because yeah. you can undershoot all this, but having the objective, front and center first off there's no negative to that right so nobody's ever going to tell me there's a negative to that yeah um secondly i think it makes it easier for people to make just normal decisions over the course of a day mm -hmm. because it, is this important or is it not right so there's drama going on on fucking instagram about whatever it is and this is sitting right there mm -hmm. it's a reminder you like is this really important 
or is this more important? Because if this is taking me away from, you know, the focus on this, and if it's powerlifting, it could be powerlifting, it could be business, it's whatever it's going to be. You know, it's a set objective that you're trying to work toward. Right. You may not hit it, but there's still, what's the negative of working toward it? Right. You know, most people are just, they're not. And then they get pulled into all these other directions. And then a year will go by, two years will go by, and they'll wonder why and the fuck they're nowhere further along. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you didn't have, you might have had a, I don't even want to say a bit, you might have had an idea. But that never, you had a dream that maybe turned into an idea, but it never became a vision that could be executed on. Right. And certainly never something that was a reminder on a daily basis, and, you know? And I feel like I work pretty good off of, uh, what, what's the saying? It's like making a mountain out of a molehill. Like, I like to sit there and like, you make it bigger in your head than it really is. You know what I mean? Like, I'm talking about that that 2,000 pound total originally, and it was like this big, grandiose thing. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm shooting for it. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to it. And even like little things like, I mean, I don't, you probably have done this too, where it's like, you kind of like make things to piss you off mm -hmm. that like, they're really not there to piss you off, but like you make it like that. So you can kind of feed off of it. You know, talking to Jordan, like we were getting ready for that ghost meet, uh, the Miami meet. And, um, I would go down to his gym, which is in Northport. I'd probably drive an hour down that way and stuff. And I was going for the squat record, which was Rob Phillips' squat record. And he was going for Joe Sullivan's squat record. Mm -hmm. And so we printed out two pictures of Rob Philippus and Joe, and we put them right behind the, the squat board or the, the mono lift. So every single time we were going up to squat, it's like, you look right at that, like, mm -hmm. and like, you know, that's like cheesy, whatever, but it's like, I'd get fired up at it. You know what I mean? Cause they're, doing, you know, they're talking shit and they're like, you're really not going to squat his mate, his weight. You're really not going to do mm -hmm. this. Like he's looking at you right now. You're not going to do this. And, um, you know, and it's just like, it's funny. We're getting pissed off at a picture on the wall, but like little stuff like that, you know, we, um, that, that 2020 meet that, uh, I did in Kansas city, Craig and I both did that meet. Right. And, um, up until that point, like Craig had a pretty big total going into it. And I, I had the, a pretty decent total going into it, but we were like late add ons to the, to the roster or whatever. Right. And, um, so they do like this whole, like the Instagram thing where they put out the roster and like, they leave us off the roster and it's like, and then they do like a, a podcast where they're like, do a review for the meet and they're going off the list. They post it online and they don't even talk about us going into the, the meet. And you know, it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like to me, I, like I was just like, we use it to kind of like fire ourselves up and it's like, we're traveling across the country. You're strong. He'd squatted nine thirty seven in sleeves at that point. I had a 22, 26 total at that point, 900 pound squat. And I'm like, these fuckers aren't even talking about us, man. Like they didn't even, they didn't even bring us up on the podcast. And, um, so we get out there and, uh, Garrett fear is the one that did the, um, the podcast about it. And he was like announcing the meetings on the live stream and he was right there. And the person putting the attempts in was right, you know, right next to him basically. And, uh, every single squat, you know, I had an attempt and I go right up to him and, uh, he he's, he's right there on the live stream for the meet. And I was like, Am I good enough to get on the meet now? Or am I good enough to get on the podcast now, Garrett? Am I good enough to get up on the podcast? <laughs> He's like, and anyone watching at home could hear him, you know, it's me saying that. And like, what were you saying to Garrett? And he's just like, you know, it's little stuff like that. You know what I mean? Just to kind of fire us up. It's just like, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I'm a pretty chill guy. I'm a pretty lax guy and stuff like that. I don't have problems with anybody, but like, you know, if you can just turn it on for 20 seconds, I think that's like a skill. You know what I mean? If you can sit there and just fire yourself up and get you pissed off and what, but then turn it off right away. Cause it's mm -hmm. hard to stay up there. You know what well, I mean? You don't want to go too high either. No. You know, yeah, but you need to be able to switch. It's, it's towing that line, but I, I love to be in there for like that 20 seconds, man. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you white out. Like you just, all you are is just feeling it. You know what I mean? Like if you're feeling that squat and you know, you're yelling after the fact and stuff like that. And it's like, we have, we have that picture up for the, um, the podcast today. And it's like, it's me yelling after that big squat and stuff. I'm a, I'm a chill, mild man. Guy, but when I go out there, man, I gotta, I gotta just jack myself up. And it's like, and even that, like, like that was, it's like years of just grinding at something that I've been working for and stuff. And like, you have this image, this goal, this, this thing you're pursuing. And it's like, you finally get there and it's like, that that's the coolest picture to me because that's it's literally me just screaming out to everybody like it's like i did it you know what i mean like all this seven years of just kind of grind to this point 
I did it and it was worth it. And I, you know, I, I conquered this thing that I set out to. And like, obviously, you know, like I said, it, it's cool for about f- and you want to do more, but like, I love that feeling, man. I love there, it. And there is something about, and fucking, I mean, there's something about the, from, from the chalk box to the time you finish a heavy squat, there's, there's, that it's, I, I'm trying very hard to not say it's the best thing in life, but it's right up there. Dude, that's a high, with, like you know, none it's other. A, it's with, 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 without kids and being married, it would be the best thing in life. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm struggling to, to even, you know, cause that might even be better. Right. Because it's still for whatever it is, whatever that time but period it's, it's is. Such a, it's, it's 20, like literally even after you do it, it's, it's, it's such a fleeting feeling, but when you're in that space and oh, you're it's amazing, it's, it's the best man. Yeah. And, um, that's what I call that void space, man. Yeah. There's just nothing there. It's fucking awesome. And it, it, you can always find that. Right. So if you're ever worried, like you're not going to find that you can fucking find it. And, and that's <clears> what's <throat> kind of, it's like you train for like five, six months for that 10 seconds. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's worth it every time. You know what I mean? It's, mm. it's just, uh, part of it's almost like for me, like I said, I commit to everything on that board and I write it down. And part of it's like, it's relief. Like I put all this pressure on myself and I did it. And then like, whew, like I didn't fuck that up. You know what I mean? But like at the same, it's, it's a mix of it. You know what I mean? Like I fucking did it, but then it's just like, I fucking did it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're just like, I don't know. Well, there's a time, there's that, that time before, you know, there's <clears throat> anything can happen. Yeah. You know, it can be good. It can be bad, you know, whatever. But at a certain point in time, it's just like, you know what? Fuck all that. You know, this, this is what it is. Mm-hmm. And when I was talking earlier though, is and when you get to that squat and then it starts to, you know, stop, you're in that fucked up place. Mm-hmm. Right. But there's to be able to actually think and process when you're in that fucked up place is another level of a skill that I think the only way you get that is to be in that fucked space so many times Mm -hmm. that you can understand that when you get there it's like oh shit slowing down then you start thinking my head back like what's not feeling like it should Mm -hmm. and then correct and then be able to go time almost slows down when you're in there though like it's so weird like that you can think like like, it literally everything stops and it's like i was telling you the other day like i was i was squatting at a meet once and i was maybe halfway down and i was like i should be bracing a lot more than i am like how can you process all that or even coming up coming up and like i said and I, I just need that rack command it's just like hold it hold it hold it hold it hold it you know what i mean and then as soon as he says it you can mm-hmm. drop it and they'll take you you know what i mean but um yeah dude, it's uh you know i got however many weeks i am out right now like it's probably 20 something weeks it's like that's I'm, I'm training for that feeling you know what i mean in december like I, I want that feeling i didn't get that feeling this last meet you know what i mean like i, I went out there for that that world record squat i'm one i'm one for three on world record squats right now i missed it in kansas city i got it in miami and i just missed texas so um or one and two ones for that Wolverine mm-hmm. squat so it's like I, I i want that back you know what i mean like I, it's time to go back there and kind of chip what i just did with um, everything that goes into the training that you have and that ha- all the work that has to be done from now until until then how much of that because it's <clears throat> and i think this will come out this is Bob Merck's podcast will come out in a couple of weeks, but he talked a lot about, you know, we're fortunate and privileged because we get to do this. And I've had other people that say the same thing that, and I, I kind of understand what they're talking about where what they're, what they're talking is, you know, there's a lot of people that will come out and say, I have to do this. And I, and you really don't have to do mm-hmm. anything, but there is a balance there too. Right. Because a lot of the, you can't just live in this, I get to do world because there's always going to be shit associated with what you're going to have to do to get ready mm-hmm. or what I have to do for my training or business or whatever it is. That isn't something I'm really happy that I get to do. Yeah. I just, in a way, I, I have to do that where sometimes I think that that I get to position gives a false impression to a lot of people that they think that every day they go to the gym is oh this is great i get to do this where there's a lot of times you're going to go to the gym where you don't want to go to the gym and yeah you can remind yourself and say i'm lucky i get to do this but you still kind of have to do it i like it's I, semantics i get that you know I'm, yeah but but I, I you know even going into this last me in april like there was like i think there was a burnout point for me at a certain point where like people would ask me they're like how you are you ready for the media are you excited or whatever and i was just like so I'm just ready to get this over with. I'm yeah. ready just to go. And like, you know, at, at a certain point, you're kind of like, 
well, that's how you should feel before mm-hmm. a meet. Like you should be pretty beat. You should be ready to just like recover and taper and, and peak, you know? But, you know, I, I feel like I said that so many times and it, it came off. I was just like, like oh, I got to do this. I'm just ready to get it over with. I'm ready to get it over with. And I was driving home from the gym uh, after one of my, my last sessions. And I was, I was talking to my girlfriend and I was like, I kind of feel like an asshole saying that. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, if, if I got a, a, a younger kid at the gym or somebody that's like, you know, just getting into it or whatever. And they're, they're, they're just like, they're happy to be there. They're stoked about training and stuff. And then they look at me and I'm at this like position and all I'm doing is bitching about it. And I'm like, I just, you know, I'm ready to get it over with, you know, preps. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, like, you kind of feel like, like shitty. Like I, like I, I'm lucky or I'm able to do this. I'm lucky to do this is whatever is, is not necessarily the way I would word it. It's like, I'm privileged to be in the position I'm in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like how many people, like we're talking about like that list, how many people do this that would kill to be trying oh, yeah. to hit a world record total or kill to hit a world record squat? And I'm over here like, I'm just ready to get it over. Well, I think that's, imp- I still, though, I still think that's important for us to see because they're going to think that. Yeah. Right. And when they think that during certain phases of prep, because it's harder, they need to know this is normal. Yeah. This is kind of how you're going to feel. Right. And that way they, they don't sit there and have this false impression that, no, wait a minute everybody else is you know all good Mm -hmm. where some people are just better at hiding it but like you were saying too it's like you can feel like that but at the end of the day like i'm i don't have to do the oh exactly you know what i mean i'm choosing because at the end of the day we love it you Mm -hmm. know what i mean the highs the lows because when it when it hits man it's like a lottery it's like it's like when it hits and everything you've been doing all the, the the bad sessions you've had coming into the meet whatever and they pay off at the meet you hit big I mean, dude, there's like, we were just talking about, there's no mm-hmm. bigger high than that. Cause it's like, you did that. Like you overcame all that shit and you, you sat there and knocked it out when it mattered. So I don't think you get that high if you don't overcome the shit to the extent that you just said earlier that you'll make up shit to have to overcome yeah. that high better. Cause you, you give it meaning. You yeah. know what I mean? If you, if you go in and it's like, you know, say like, I'm talking about this squat, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the first one I before the going into it, I was like, well, I just missed it. But like, I'm definitely going to get that. You know, I'm definitely going to get that next time. Like, it's just going to happen. And I, I don't want to say I got complacent, but I just kind of expected like it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then I had that session, like I said, five weeks out where I missed my squat. And it's like, it's like a check. It's like, well, maybe I'm not going to get this. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, I, I really, it, you realize where it's like, it was something where I was like, it already kind of lost its value before I even did it kind of deal. And it's like, well, now it's like, it's not promised to me. Like, you're not guaranteed shit. Like you still need to work for this. Like mm-hmm. nothing's, you're not going to just sh- get it. Cause you, you tried it last time. You know what I mean? And, um, like I said, tearing my thumbs and like having that missed bench and missed squat going into it. It wasn't the best prep I've had, but I made it the best meat I've had. And I think that's, that's the key is it's executing on the day. And it's like, whatever happened previously kind of going in, you're going to mitigate as much as you can going in, but you still have to be able to show up. You can have the best prep and shit the bed at the meat. You know what I mean? And it's like, is if you just go in thinking, well, it's just going to, you know, I'm just, I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to get it regardless. Like it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. You, know? you, um, <clears throat> you know, the history of the sport more or better than most who are in your fuck. I sound old when I say this, your generation, your age of lifters, who are the, who were your early influences, but who were the bigger influences once you started looking more back into because your early influences are only who's around you right? exactly so, so who are they but then who did they become later so i think like starting off and i wish i would have probably wrote some of these down some of space on names but like i definitely am like a, a nerd for the sport the sport first and like a lifter second in the sense that like like i said i i work from home so i'm just i'm always just kind of on my phone on youtube or instagram or whatever and open power lifting. and it's like i just love like kind of just like scaling back and like looking at you know old videos like i'm I'm talking about the old wpo stuff or or whatever and it's like um so like starting off and like i said brandon allen was definitely like a like somebody i definitely looked up to but then even coming up like you know like it it became like obviously dan like dan's he's the man he's the number Mm -hmm. one guy in the sport right now and like you know i was definitely uh a fan of him just like you know just looking at him on instagram prior and to sit there and say he's one of my really good friends now is like it's it's a it's a really cool deal you know what i mean it's mm-hmm. like you go from looking up to somebody to to sitting there and just like they're you know there's somebody that like they they look at you as just like you know a friend or whatever you know what i mean and um and even like you know the first the first meet i did with him 
um, we'll, we'll go back to the, the people I looked up to, but like the first meet I ever did with him was in 2020. It was right before COVID. So we, um, we had, uh, it was the week before they, they canceled all the stuff at the Arnold and everything. So like, we had just like, basically like missed the cutoff for that. So our meet happened, but he was, he was trying to hit a qualifying total to, um, to go to, uh, the showdown meet that we were doing in, uh, the later part of the year. And so he had said online that, you know, he's going to come in, he's just going to hit openers. He's going to hit like a, a 22 54 or something like that. And I was going in there and like, I'm going to hit a 23 Oh three in wraps. And like, you know, based on the coefficients, like I'll beat him on coefficients. He had just hit the world record total that, that prior fall. And, uh, same thing, like kind of making a mole out of a um, mountain out of a mole hill. Like I was like, I'm going to go into this meet and like, he's not going to try and that's whatever, but I, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to, I'm going to beat Dan Bell at this meet or whatever. And I feel like I had this mentality kind of going in to, to meets where it's like, it's serious. And it's like, we've all been that guy where you got to go sit in the corner and you got to mm-hmm. jack yourself up and, and you're crying before a lift or whatever. You gotta, you gotta go to that crazy place. And it's like, it's, it's you know, do that, but it's like, it's, it's not really sustainable. And it's like, you kind of come off like an asshole a little bit to everyone else in the room or whatever. And so we show up to this meet. And, um, I, I'd seen him a little bit, maybe the, the day before it weigh-ins and then, um, I show up to the meet and I'm putting my, my singlet straps up and he comes up on the other side and just grabs, I'd never even talked to this guy. He comes up and starts putting my singlet straps up. He's like, Hey man, he's like, uh, do you have like a, a screwdriver for like a belt or anything I can use? And then I was shocked. He kind of even talked to me and stuff. And like, I was just like, I said something like quick back. I was like, it's like, aren't you like a diesel mechanic? Like you don't have a screwdriver <laughs> or anything. And he's just like, he's like, ah, he's like, oh yeah, good point. <laughs> it's like, I got a screwdriver for you. And, um, and then we just kind of start talking, you know what I mean? And, uh, I'm sitting in the back and like, we're just kind of warming up near each other and he starts talking to me and he's just like, he's, you know, we're just kind of shooting the shit in the back and stuff. And like, you know, it, it kind of like melted this whole, like I said, I gotta, I gotta work myself. I just melted this whole thing. I'm like, this guy is super cool and he's, he's chill, but he, I've never seen somebody so lax at a meet. Like he's in the back drinking beers. Like I said, he, he came up, we were all warming up. Right. And so it's already 500 pounds on the, on the bar. And we go, he, he comes in in slides and just like shorts and t-shirt. And that's his first squat. He just gets under the bar and he just sits at the bottom for a little bit and slides and then comes up. And, and I was just like, what the fuck? And so then we're, we're warming up and everything. And then I go out and I hit my 903 squat. He goes out and does 900, 950, 1,003. He wasn't, he's like, it's just too, feeling too good today. I just, I, I, I got to keep going. And so I was just like, what the hell? And so he does that and he goes out and he's just drinking beers and he's, he's having fun. And he's just, he's just, he's having a good time. It's a party. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? We warm up for bench and my bench was kind of whatever, but then he goes out and he knocks out a PR like 578. And he's just, he's having a great day right now. Right. And I'm just like, what the hell? And then we go to warm up for deadlift and I'm, I'm, you know, this, my deadlift is, is kind of down at this point. So I'm trying to, you know, bring it back up at this meet, you know, hit something a little more than eight. And, um, he literally does 700 and 750 as his only two deadlift warm ups, both with straps. He's like, I'm good. And he goes out and he pulls eight, 880, 903 smokes it's the all-time mm-hmm. uh world record total raw like 2485 or something like that and he like had just like had his honeymoon the week prior he came in he wasn't really like he was just like nothing serious about it just came in so just like chill having fun hanging out with people and like you know that, that were watching the meat and stuff and he has he hits the biggest total <laughs> in, in raw powerlifting and like i think from that was you know, and I've done a handful of meets with him afterward and I've, I've adopted that mentality of like, you can be serious and you can, you can get yourself all fired up and whatever, but like, we're here because we love this. Mm -hmm. We enjoy this. Like you shouldn't be like a, a pissy asshole while you're competing or whatever. It's like, you choose to do this. You wanted to do this. You know what I mean? And, um, so I looked up to him prior to that, but like, I really looked up to after that after we became friends just based on the way that he he approaches the sport man it's like you know and he becomes like i said he gets this total and like every meet we've gone to after that it's like he's the man and he takes his time to sit there and talk to anybody that wants to talk to him he's the coolest dude in the warm-up room he helps out anybody 
and it's like you know the numbers he hits are are crazy you know what i mean it's like i've seen him do some of the craziest things i've seen in the sport but like the way he he carries himself and he handles himself that's like I want to be like that. You know what well, I mean? It's smart too. If you think it through, because one way you can self-destruct, Yeah, you know, with anxiety and everything and aggression, yeah. you know, just getting prepared. And then on the other side, you're just chill yeah. and there's no cortisol, you know, and you just turn it on when you need to turn it on. Yeah. So he's definitely been somebody, you know, like I said, to this day, I still look up to him just the way he carries himself and, and, and does what he does. But, um, you know, so off that initial face value, like those, be like, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of coming in. Like, I look up to these guys because they're strong. But then you kind of delve back and you look at, like, what guys were doing, like, way, way back in the day and stuff. And it's, like, the guys like Dave Passanella squatting, like, mm-hmm. crazy weights. And it's like, you, you, if you talk to somebody about that, like, now, like, people probably don't even know who that guy is. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And he was, like, freak show at 275. Crazy volume, too. Crazy volume mm-hmm. and just, like, a huge dude. And, like, you know, like, all – Louis, there's all those old, like, I think they're probably, like, the VHS tapes from, like, the West mm-hmm. Side videos. But they're, like – on youtube now and stuff and i'll watch a ton of the stuff that like what you guys were mm-hmm. doing and like uh, i mean like i said i'm a space on names now and stuff but like even like i said just like yesterday we're in here and, and matt smith is, mm-hmm. is showing me how to do like the, the inclined tape presses mm-hmm. and like the rolling dumbbells because i said you know i was I, usually i try and do those and they kind of hurt my elbows or whatever and it's like it's just it's such it's such a cool thing for like to just sit there and like somebody that I, I've, I've looked up to you know, it's just like you see these guys doing these crazy numbers then they want to kind of just like there's cool you know what mm-hmm, i mean like everyone mm-hmm. just kind of wants to help you out and like do you know they want they're trying to pass that on they want you to be the next kind of guy to sit there and smash these numbers or whatever you know it's just that that part of it's cool to me anytime i've met somebody that's like whether it's you or you know like a lifter that's lifting now it's like they're always like you said like you were saying like everyone that's in that like that top percent mm-hmm. we all get what it took to kind of get to that so it's like everyone's going to have for the majority part you know that's not everybody but like for the majority part everyone's going to have the same chilled out mentality where it's like we all can kind of get along we can all kind of semi coexist and you know it's like you want to beat the other guy but it's like you want to beat him when you're at your best kind yeah. of a deal you know what i mean well, you, you also understand though too that there, there's a lot of there's a lot of shit that's kind of in our control and there's a lot that's not in our control and you can come into the meet with the best training cycle you ever had and have a fucking terrible day or vice versa mm-hmm. terrible training cycle and come in and have the best meteor and um when you've been through all of that enough it's easier to see you know when somebody's having a good day you can appreciate somebody else is having a really good day Mm -hmm. because sometimes those don't come around as often as we would all like yeah especially when it's like one of them caddyshack days you know what i'm saying it's like what the hell look at this shit this guy's hitting 50 pound prs out of nowhere you know what's happening is he's having a good time when he does that and it just it rolls contagious it's contagious because if you know like if if we're all having a good time in the back and we're all smack numbers like you want to get in on that you know what i mean like if it's it's just one of those things where i don't know if 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 somebody's lifting good if two or three guys have gone before you it's like well fuck i can't not i can't not go out there and smash yeah. my number now you know what i mean like it just keeps rolling that's a good point it's it's momentum like momentum, in football it definitely right is, yeah <clears throat> so it's the same thing because you can see it in meets too like somebody could just start missing or somebody could get hurt somebody has to change that momentum well that's i mean i've definitely been in a couple meets where we're talking about you know that, that same meet uh Dan, I squatted my my first 903 in wraps. I'm getting ready to go, right? And uh I'm already all wrapped up and everything. And the guy that's going before me is an equipped lifter. And he's coming halfway up and he stalls out and just pukes all over the fucking platform, like right under where the bar is at, right? Pukes. They gotta take the bar from him, whatever. And so everyone just kind of gets quiet and it's just like they're like, all right, we're just gonna, we're gonna just uh chill for a second, we're gonna clean this up and we're gonna get and I stand up and I'm like, I'm wrapped. Like I'll, I'll go. I squat wide. I'll, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm good. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just step around. Uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that, the, the, the older guy, I was telling you, I used to train with a uh, bug band, Tom O'Donnell. He's a side judge there. Right. And see, he looks over at me and he looks at the, the meat directors, the head judge. He's like, this is powerlifting. This ain't the prom. Let's go. <laughs> and I go out there and over, a, I stand over a pile of puke and I, I dunk my first nine Oh three and it goes right up, man. And it's like, and everyone blows up goes right after me and squats a thousand three you know what i mean it's just uh and he, he squats close so so they had to clean the shit up he, 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 he was in sleeve so <laughs> i think he was cool with them cleaning it up for a little bit but um <laughs> even that like i've i've been at meets where like you know you are wrapped and like i was doing it with one of my buddies uh 
uh, and you know he he dumps the bar and it's like he gets he gets fucked up you know what i mean and like the bar goes over his head and like his his adductors all messed up and they got to pick the bar back up and then then you do have to really kind of like you know it's one of those it, it's one of those things where then you really have to kind of like get yourself away from it a little mm-hmm. bit. You know what I mean? You can't look at that. Like we're talking about um, lifting videos where people get fucked up, whether it's an arm or a leg and stuff. And it's like, I don't even, I mean, like I, if, if it happens, you know, I'm, I'm sorry it happens and stuff, but it's like, I can't look at it. Cause it's like, I can't put that in my head of like that actually happening. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I definitely feel like, and you know, I think I've heard you talk about it too. Where like, there's definitely times where like, I'm not at the gym and I think about, squatting or whatever and it's kind of like it freaks you out a little mm-hmm. bit you know what i mean like it's like i don't want to say you get scared of it but like you you definitely just realize like what i'm getting under or you know what i mean like what could happen kind of deal and um and that sucks too because it's like while you're while you're not at the gym you could you can think about that but like when you show like well, as soon as i walk in here it's like that's gone you know what i mean you can't you can't think like that at all because it's like you, you just can't have that in your, your head you know what i mean i just got to go out and like all you can think is like i'm getting I'm going up and I'm going to get it, you know? It's interesting because it's, you said that because I know a lot of lifters that way they, they, they won't watch videos where somebody like snaps an arm or blows a quad. I, but here, here's the, the interesting thing that just dawned on me when you said this is you don't want to put that in your brain. I get it. Nobody wants to put that in the brain, but they'll go on Instagram, TikTok, or whatever else and put a bunch of other garbage bullshit in their brain, which yeah. might be just as destructive. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how odd is that? <laughs> it's like, even, I don't know. It's one of those things too, where like, I, I love hate Instagram. I love hate social media in the sense that like, I get to what, like uh, mine's literally just catered straight to lifting. You know what I mean? If it was just, if it was literally just called the powerlifting app and it was just for me to just look at other people's numbers or whatever else and just kind of, I don't really care what vacation you just went on or what, <laughs> what you just had for breakfast or whatever. Like, I want to see what someone squatted or benched mm-hmm, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I love it for, aspect but like it does where it's like even before we started this i'm on my phone and just like i'm like you're just you're zipping through things and it's like you know like it just it doesn't mean anything but you just want the next what's what's the next thing what's the next thing what's the next thing and it's like you know i I feel like i have to like you know it's it's, restrict yourself on like okay i can't go on instagram today or like you delete it while you're i don't know if a lifter if you need to restrict yourself it's just is it helping or hurting yeah. right because it may motivate you yeah like some people are gonna be motivated by some of the stuff out there some people are gonna be but but if it's hurting where all you're doing is comparing yourself to other people and it's fucking you up in the gym well then maybe you don't want to do that yeah i feel like i almost then i don't need we were talking about like a chip on the shoulder the other day like i feel like i always like i i never wherever i'm at on those rankings like i don't like to associate myself like i always feel like i have to earn like the next meet i have to earn to be somewhere close to that you know what i mean i have to Mm -hmm. aspire to sit there and be close to that and the people you look at like the higher you go up on that the, li- the list of people that you're trying to beat gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And like, those become like your, your primary like targets of like, I need to do this. I need to do that kind of deal. And, um, but I almost feel like it's even like, you know, it's, it's like that four minute mile theory where it's like one person does it. So everyone does it, you know what I mean? They see it's possible. They see that they're able to do it. Dude, it certainly is to the other, when you were in here Saturday, Matt winning was in here, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'd have to look it up, but how many years ago did he break the all time sleeve squat record with fucking eight it like was eight thirty two, yeah and like that was like and that was so surreal for me because i remember coming so when when i first started like i said 2016 i had uh, uh you know you, you look at the numbers and stuff like that and he was he was the number one guy and he had that squat record and um i just remember like you, you just start and it's like i just remember like oh man it would be so cool to sit there and like your number's a hundred fucking pounds more and that was what five years ago yeah. or something like that. it may be longer than that uh, like, i think 2016 2015 somewhere around he hit it but it like so you see my point so yes numbers go up over a period of time you, but i was the one that was geeked out to me like, you know, <laughs> you I, I, I talked to him for 10 seconds i went over to the chalk he was he was chalking up and like i didn't want to like you know, yeah. I know he, he likes his tempo at the meet his training and stuff and uh i was just like i was like hey matt uh, my name's shane haller and i was like trying to think of what to say i was like uh, i'm a big fan of your content and he's like that's cool and like it's nice yeah. to meet you man and then he just went and did his thing and stuff but i was just like it's like i said it's surreal to me to sit there and like exactly it's somebody you look up to for so long or like whatever and it's like you put yourself in the same category as them now you know what i mean like you guys are now equals instead of like somebody for me i was sitting there thinking holy shit this sport's going fucking bananas man 
because I, I remember when he did like, holy shit, he yeah. did that in sleeves. And now not that far later, it's, it's a hundred pounds more. There's, there's more people going into raw with sleeves. So that plays a factor into that as well. Yeah. But you know, you, there's, he didn't have a whole group of people pushing right underneath those he was numbers. at the threshold he was at, at the point. threshold yeah. you got people nipping at your ass you know there and you're training with people yeah that squat more in a bigger class yeah fuck you just said like three of them and one meet well i'll go yeah. to like you know, like i said every <laughs> craig foster is my my training partner and it's like i have a 925 squat he's got a thousand twenty five squat there's a big difference and mm -hmm. like even bench like i, I bench 556 at a 606 so it's like I go, you know, I, I have the bigger total, so it's like, you know, whatever, but like, I still train with him every single day, squat and bench. And it's like, he's the one taking my lunch. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. I got to load more plates for Craig. I got to do. So it's like, I'm always chasing him. You know what I mean? But it pushes me to sit there and push my numbers up to a point where like, they can be comparable with his. But then when I look back, it's like, if, if I've, if I'm trying to chase him and I get close, I've widened that gap that much more from everyone else behind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah yeah so and even like i said being around him and dan and you know like those are those are the best squat sessions i'm the i'm the littlest guy in the squat the squat group at that point you know what i mean him and him and dan are both doing thousand plus you know and i'm you know i'm the little guy in the group you know mm -hmm. what i mean and it's like i don't have a little squat but like comparatively like that's my bubble you know what i yeah. mean and like that's what i'm going to compare it to and that's my perception of it you know what i mean I listened to several podcasts that you were on you know preparing for this one and you know i need to apologize shit about pokemon but <laughs> you you from what i understand you're like a fucking master of pokemon yes no uh, so, i mean like it's definitely like um it was like 30 minutes of a live watch yes. podcast so we um <laughs> it's, I, it's like something i've played since i was like a little kid so it's like the video game pokemon it's not like the uh the card game and stuff but i feel like you know that's you do something since for like i mean it's like 20 plus years of doing something you know what i mean even if it's like a game like i don't do it like competitively or I play it but it's just like it's the consistency of doing something and just like getting better at it as you do it and I think it's almost you know in a weird way I can sit there and look at it like the same way as this where it's like we talked about this the other day and it's like I feel like we all kind of try and put like a like a timeline or like an end game or like what am I really working towards with powerlifting and it's like you know it, just talking to you and Todd yesterday it's like and it's like he's telling me he's like he doesn't even have pecs really you know what I mean mm -hmm. and he's still coming in here and benching and to look for a reason to like be like okay well i can hit this number so i can be content you know what i mean it's like i don't ha I, I don't have to look at it like that like if it's something i love doing and it's like you know it's something that like it's become like a, a huge part of who i am like you know like not say a pokemon is a huge part of who i am but it's like i have that tendency of like if i like something i'm gonna keep it and i'm gonna do it and then it's gonna just be a part of what i do you know what i mean and it's like even this like there's gonna be a day where like you know like i'm not hers that I once was at some point and there's probably going to be a day where well, there will be a day where it's like this is my last competition but it doesn't mean I have to stop coming in here and like training I don't have to don't I don't have to stop having that hunger and fire of wanting to sit there and push myself and exert myself in the gym there's no better feeling it's just this is every lower body day I do so like I'll I'll get through my top two stuff my, my main movement my secondary and then I go through my my accessories and whatever they may be cossack lunges or reverse height or whatever and i'm exhausted at this point you know what i mean it's typically during the week it's like 9 30 close to 10 o'clock at night and the last thing i have is abs and i usually superset those with with uh my reverse hypers and i every single time it's like i do my last set of abs and i just lay out on the turf mm -hmm. and i just lay out and i'm just it's a big smile on my face and i'm like you did it you earned it you're done you're done for today you're done for today and i love that man like there's no there's nothing better than like going into something that like say, say you had a long day at work or whatever and you go in and it's like i don't know if i really want to be at the gym or whatever but you show up regardless because you're committed to it and you go through the motion it's not that you have to do it it's like i'm i myself have committed myself to this like i said i was going to do this i said i was going to do xyz today at the gym i need to do that with my training i need to sit there and continue along this progress to peak for the meet or whatever and it's there's there's no more gratifying feeling than like going into something you're either not sure of or you were apprehensive of and you just go in there and you knock it out of the park and you just like 
you it all it's just like i earned it i did this and it, that can be with training that can be with your job that mm-hmm. can be with even this podcast i was for you messaged me about this you know months ago and like i've been shooting my pants about coming <laughs> on here because it's like dude like i said I'm, I'm a nerd for powerlifting first and foremost so it's like i watch this and it's like i don't want to say something stupid or i don't want to do this it's like my I perceive me this way or whatever and it's like it, like and literally i walk in on saturday and it's like i meet you and i'm like he's just the coolest dude and this is just a gym i live in a gym like this is this is where i'm I, I I'm at this is where I'm always like I love to be here. This is where I thrive. You know what I mean, and um, and just even sitting here just shooting the shit with you. It's like it's we go back to this pri- you know privilege to be here thing. Like I'm just so grateful. Where like I said, I I still picture myself as the guy just getting into this in 2016, and I'm just looking at all these people, and I just love like just the strength sport in general. Whether it's strongman, whether it's powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, like arm wrestling like i'm into sumo wrestling and stuff too like whatever it may be like i'm just so i I feel privileged just to sit there and just like be one good at what i'm doing you know what i mean because everyone wants to be good at whatever they're doing but to sit there and just kind of get like i don't know like that acknowledgement from my peers that i look up to so much when we when craig and i did that meet in uh in 2020 we went to the showdown where we weren't on the roster and we went there no one knew who we were when we were there all the big name lifters were there, you know, and they didn't know who we were. They knew who we were by the time we left. <laughs> and to, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's cheesy, but to, there's something really fucking cool about like, just to get that nod from somebody else that like you look up to and you want to aspire to sit there and lift like, or whatever to sit there and just get that nod that they're just like, yeah, like you're, you're one of us, you know what I mean? Or like, you you feel like you're on par with those people. Like you're not looking up to them anymore. Like you're, your equals, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, um, I don't, I mean, like obviously the internal grat, you know, gratification, of this whole thing is like, it's, it's all for us. You know what I mean? Like no one knows your numbers or whatever more than you do, but like, it's like, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's something with just getting that acknowledgement from everybody. Else. That's a like, cool thing with the sport that yeah. I think people forget too often, right? You can do some version of, of <clears throat> finding the, that 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 state between the chalk box and the squat mm-hmm. you, know, you can find some version of that the rest of your life <clears throat> i mean that's there you know it's power lifting strength whatever you want to call it you know it's always there that you can always fill that so yeah. it's not like that's gonna be taken away it's not taken away the hard thing to navigate is are you gonna let the sport take you out or are you gonna go out before the sport takes you out and that's that's a different conversation but that's when you don't need to about because mm-hmm. it has no influence on what you're going to do to the next meet well even then if it does you know and i feel like that's always like that's kind of like the the power lifting like red badge of courage you know what i mean like you want to kind of almost like you don't want to but like a lot of we, we ride it till the wheels come off you know what i mean and i think that's like something- i think it's a little different now because there's more people out there mm-hmm. to kind of intervene and there's before the, that, yeah, yeah. Well, I call them realists and enablers, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, th- there's people that you can actually really listen to. Because everybody's going to tell you to stop before you want to stop. You already know that. Yeah. Fuck, they told you to stop before you even started, right? So, I mean, that's just kind of part of it. And, um, but they'll, there's, a, there's a time where, it's, you know, it gets rocky, man, where you don't know. But sometimes it's just a bad two-year. Like Dave talked about it on the first podcast, I think. You have, like, you go through ruts, mm-hmm. you know, and each rut seems to last about fucking a year and a half, two years. And then, wham, like, fuck, what happened there? Yeah. There's hundred pounds on my total and then eventually you hit another one you know there's enough people i think around now and social media helps with this to be able to kind of say you know what maybe this is just one of them fucking ruts yeah or you know what you've been through like six of these ruts already you probably should be done yeah right but then there's the other ones that are like you know you know they should be done and they know they should they be done let it go. but they're just gonna keep fighting and there's people that are like fuck it man that's what you want to do i'm cool yeah. just let me know when to call nine you know i'm cool and so that's a that's a cool thing with the sport because there's always people that understand yeah you know they've kind of been through it i think even just having like the right people in your corner though too like to be brutally honest with you like you know maybe you shouldn't do this or like dude don't be a pussy like come on mm-hmm. you know what i mean like you're good and i think like you don't need a ton of them but if you got like just a good core group of people like i said craig nick and sean like they've been they've been doing this with me since you know sit last six seven years you know what i mean craig and i have literally together we've gone from i, I he him about a 1900 pound total and me about a 2000 
up to my 2347 and his like 2292. And I mean, to sit there and to do that together, meet to meet year after year. I mean, there's, there's, there's times where it's just, it's just me and him at the gym for like, you know, at nine o'clock at night on a Friday, you know what I mean? And it's like, anyone we don't even speak to each other like we're just like mm -hmm. he does a set i load my weight i do my set i load and we go back forth back forth back forth but it's like i can tell that guy to show up at the gym you know mm -hmm. what i mean so it's like and he'll be he'll tell he knows what my training is supposed to look like and i know what his is supposed to be look like and i can you know he squats more than me but i get on his ass more about his squat technique and getting down and like don't be late like, more than anyone and it's like that dude's one of the best squatters in the world but like I've been around him enough to know like when, what buttons to push, where he needs to be doing better things and stuff. And like, he does the same with me. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's good to have people in your corner like that, that like, they can meet because it's like, you're going to need those people from time to time. You know what I mean? We can, well, it comes into play too. If it's, if, it, if he's having a shitty day and it's just not turning around, mm -hmm. you know, for you to be able to say, dude, just shut, shut it, it down. down. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a big part too. And I think like, you're only going to have a certain number of people that like, maybe it's one or two people that like, they can be honest with you like that. I, um, and that's the hardest advice to take. So it needs to come from somebody that knows you very well. Oh, dude, like, <laughs> I was this last meet, we were, um, going into the gym. It was my last deadlift day. Right. And I'm all, I'm all hyped up and everything else like that. And, um, I'm at a stoplight, like two minutes from my house. And I'm, I'm, I'm texting on my phone. I'm at the stoplight. And then out of nowhere, I'm just, I just shoot forward. Some lady rear ended me, ripped off my back, my back, right tire and everything. And the first thing I think is I have to fucking go deadlift right now. And this lady's going to make me 30 minutes mm -hmm. late. And like, I had to talk to my girlfriend, my coach, Sean, and they were just like, you don't deadlift right now. Like you can't go to the gym and dead. Like, I know you want to, you might feel really good right now. Your cortisol is probably all jacked up. Like mm -hmm. your adrenaline's through the roof. Like you're going to crash. Like you don't know like what you need to go home. And then, you know, I, I went home and sure shit. I felt like ass like about mm -hmm. two hours later. And I just went to the gym and, and pulled my, my, my last heavy deadlift the next day. And it was fine. But, you know, I wanted to go to the gym. And if they hadn't told me, I would have gone to the gym mm -hmm. after getting my car totaled. You know what I mean? And, um, but I, you know, it's, you need those people in your corner to sit there and really kind of just reel you in. Cause it's like, we're going to do what we're going to do regardless. But like, as long as they can kind of guide us a little bit, you know what I mean? Like, we're still going to do what we're going to do. Like I called off work the next day. And so I could literally just go to the gym that morning to get my deadlift done. You know what I'm saying? But it was, I was, so I was going to do it regardless, but I waited yeah. you know, that, that time to sit there and make sure I got it as they told me to, it was the right call. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see with um, younger lifters coming up? I think being open to um, advice, criticism, or, or anything else would probably be one of the biggest, biggest things. Um, when, Elaborate. What do you mean? So, like, when, when someone tells you, when, you, when you're, someone's squatting and, and they come up and they have a suggestion for you, like, maybe do this, maybe do that, they're going to take it as... I'm doing something wrong. He's telling me I'm bad at this. Like, hmm. fuck him kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, and it's, there's obviously a time and a place for yeah. like advice or suggestions or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, not, I don't feel like I'm somebody that's like, if you're going to tell me I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to be like, well, get out of here. You know what I mean? Like on my, uh, on my deadlift, my sumo deadlift, I just pulled 876 at this last competition. I mean, damn your nouns. Anybody that pulls sumo right now, I'm asking them for advice. I'm asking them for what do they do this? What do they do that? Like, you know, whatever, because I, I don't feel proficient enough in it that like, it's something that I'm like very like confident on, or, you know, I'm still tweaking it every session. Mm -hmm. And even though I have a huge deadlift, I'm not going to sit there and be too good to take advice from somebody that pulls way less than me, but there's, is more proficient than mine. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think, you know, just having an open mind that like, no one's going to say, I mean, there are people, probably people out there, but like, no one's going to sit there and tell you something because they want you to, they want to fuck you up or they want to sit there and like, you know, my way is the best way or whatever. It's just like, it's a, it's a little tidbit. It's a tool you can put in your, in your toolkit. And if you need it and you implement it and it feels good, like I'm better for it. I really appreciate that advice, but it's, no one's going to sit there and, you know, if, if, if they're trying to help you out, like you don't have to sit there and turtle up right mm -hmm. away and be like, I can't sit there and listen to this because I only do, you know, SBD day, this, this that or what and you know what i mean or just like having having help or anything like that like 
to get as much help as you want because at the end of the day like i feel like we we were talking about like you know powerlifting can be so like drama you know like mm-hmm. niche and stuff like that but like at the end of the day like if you go to a meet like everybody wants everybody to do good you know what i mean like i've never been to a meet where somebody's going out to lift and people are like booing or like <laughs> want somebody to like fuck up or whatever you know what i mean like at the end of the day like everyone wants everyone to do well like you're saying it's that momentum if you're mm-hmm. doing good then we're all doing good we got it we all have to show up you know what i'm saying and um yeah so i mean like i, w- I would probably say something like that what are there any other things outside of that um yeah don't be married to one or you know one training philosophy in the sense of the same thing like be open to different things that can help you out you know what i mean like i've pulled conventional my entire powerlifting career up until this lap and i was banged up and like my i had a back injury last year and uh i didn't i couldn't deadlift you know what i mean like it hurt just to try and load like four plates and stuff and like um seth had brought up he's like well he's like well how do sumo how how does that feel and i was just like well i don't know man it's like i've never really done that and it's like it's something like you know i'm not i'm not really sure if that's something that would kind of fit with my training style and stuff and she's like oh just just give it a shot i mean it's like you're not even deadlifting right now he's like just try Mm -hmm. it you know what i mean and uh, you know and then here i am a year later still trying to figure it out but i mean i i've adopted it and it's something that's definitely benefited me my back is not nearly as like i would go from squatting to pulling and i'd always have like it would my back is uh the herniated discs i have would flare up if like you know like i don't scale it back by a certain point or if the tonnage is too much or whatever and this has allowed me to sit there and mitigate that now my hips will get a little tighter you know pretty pretty spent if i'm not watching that but it's not on my that back injury it's like it's one little tweak i've made to my game now that's like you know i'm i'm avoiding injury but like i'm still being proficient in it you know what i'm saying so what are the things that you do because you said earlier some of the extra work you do would be mobility and stuff like that at home so you mentioned your hip what do you do for hip mobility so outside I'll, of the gym so i feel like my warm-up routine has definitely kind of changed over the years and it kind of becomes situational so like i've been to you know a ton of different pts or chiros or anybody like that like that so whenever i have a specific issue that flares up i'll kind of pick up different uh warm-up exercises or whatever is gonna be needed that day to kind of make sure i'm primed and ready to go so i mean i've done ones where it's just like it's things that sean will give me and it's just kind of like i'll sit there and run through those and then say i get like a back injury and then i, I go to a different pt and i've done warm-ups that take like literally 45 minutes to sit there and get through before i train and make do i need to do all that maybe not but like mentally it was like i felt good and mentally it was like okay well i did everything that the doc told me to sit there and do and i'm feeling good now so i can kind of go through that so i feel like i've kind of i kind of pick and choose as far as uh depending on what that issue may be or something that's kind of i'm kind of working on and stuff to kind of address but typically i'll do like a 90 90 stretch and that really kind of opens up my hips my back and everything else like that i'll do that like every single day um different planks and stuff but like i've i've almost kind of uh switched from like static stretching stuff to more um active i guess in the sense so like if i'm doing like split squats i'll do like little low range split squats before i before i lift and stuff but like enough to sit there and just kind of loosen everything up like i'm getting used to kind of dropping down to like a depth position which would be kind of comfortable for squats warming up my hips and everything else um you know even like reverse hyper like kind of doing like hanging leg raises and stuff that's something i've kind of picked up now versus where like i would strictly only do maybe uh planks beforehand like now this is something it's like it's more active it's a little more dynamic and i'm kind of moving through the motion and stuff like that and just kind of getting everything warm um you know i i have like a a set range of things like i'll do in my head but really it's kind of like it goes day to day depending on where i'm at say if my my adductors are a little a little more tight maybe i'll do um you know some either copenhagen holds or some cossack lunges and stuff like that just make sure there's kind of blood in the area i'm like kind of feeling loose in there and once it's not as tight you know i don't have like a set number of reps or sets or whatever i'm going to do with those but like feel like i'm warm enough and i'm good then i kind of get start getting under the bar and kind of going from there but it really kind of depends as far as uh like what's kind of ailing me at that point like last summer when i had a strained ucl it was it was due to shoulder immobility that was putting my arm in a not you know advantageous position where like i was putting more strain on that that joint and then um so that caused that that you know that strain so I was doing a ton of shoulder mobility stuff last summer. Now I'll still incorporate a little bit of that, whether it's, and this, these were all two where it's like, 
whether it's like hanging from you know a pull-up bar and doing uh scat pull-ups or whatever um he calls it like the dynamic chicken where i, I put a band yeah. and I just kind of warming up everything in that area so when it's when it was an issue like i'll i'll do more of that i'll focus more on that kind of stuff but like it's also things that i want to kind of still keep uh involved you know like generally sit there and make sure i'm not regressing in that yeah, area. yeah so well if you if you had to do everything it would take you, you couldn't do it all right right so you, essentially what you're saying is you warm up what feels like needs warmed up. Right. And, and I, you activate what feels like needs activated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of what everybody should do. And it's still like, it's, it's still one of those things too, where like, I like to have my checklist though. So like, if I have like a set, you know, I don't know, like every, every probably like six months, I would say it kind of varies where I'll pull some things out. I'll add some things or whatever, but you still kind of have that, that checklist of different things. Like if I'm doing um you know, like an upper body day, like I'm going to want to sit there and do those scat pains. I'm going to want to warm my shoulders up. I'll probably do a couple, ups on the ground just kind of just get the the blood flow in my pecs and everything else like that kind of warm up my shoulders and everything else like there's certain things you kind of work in but like um you know like i said when when things are flaring up a little more then i'll, I'll kind of focus a little more on certain things what about nutritionally trying to move up and keep and push your weight so this has been something that last prep i was probably i don't want to say the heaviest i've been but as far as, as like a lean composition wise like i was probably 318 leading into the last competition I did. And so, um, whereas I'll usually try and like scale back a little bit after a meet and kind of drop a little weight, try and get maybe in the, the two nineties or somewhere around there. This time I, I stayed right around the weight Cause I knew, you know, like I said, I wanted to do that meet in July. So I figured I was going to be there. So I kept my weight up and then that one got pushed back to October. So still kept my weight up. And then that got pushed back to April. So by the time I got to April, like I said, I was probably the biggest I had, I had been at that point, but, um, uh, so I didn't like, you know, I wanted a cut down to make the weight class and then a little bit lower to get that coefficient score. Um, so this time around, I've kind of tweaked my, my, my macros a little bit to where I'm probably eating somewhere around like three to 3,500 calories a day. And, uh, I pull the meal out, so I'm not eating as often, but that's like one of the benefits of working from home where I'm not huge on, uh, I mean, I've done it, but like, I'm not huge on like, just like if it's cold food and it's like you, you make it three in advance four days in advance by the time you get to that fourth day tupperware it's like it's kind of gross that chicken's nasty that mm -hmm. steak's like <laughs> you know leather and everything else like that so one of the benefits of working from home is i mean i have like a a rice maker and it's like a legit like japanese rice maker so it stays like fresh all day mm -hmm. long and stuff like that like i cook all we have an air fryer and stuff so i'll cook up uh all my different i'll do chicken uh chicken thighs um we do costco so i mean you just load mm -hmm. up on all the different steak and everything else like that um as far as like even like gut health so like I'll sit there and take like kefir, like the that like the dairy deal, and um, like kimchi and stuff like that. So I feel like you know e even that super greens and stuff, just kind of keeping everything. Uh, Where's your weight now? So right now I'm just about three hundred. So uh, down from I, I, the lowest I've gotten like in the morning is about two ninety six. And it's kind of like one of those things where you get like scared. You're like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to keep dropping here. But um, to a point, like I said, I wanted to be somewhere in that range of two ninety five to three hundred. Um, so that way I can kind of bulk back up into the meat. So yeah. I'll be a full 308 by the time I, I show up in December, but it's like, I'm eating into that versus like this last time, like I literally dropped 15 pounds the week of the meat trying to make, you know, a, a, yeah. an arbitrary number that was even lower than the weight class that I needed to be, you know? So for you to stay where you're at right now, it's you're the, the, obviously that's why the calories are low, yeah. right? So you're, you're trying to not weigh less than 296. Mm -hmm. is the number is or is it are you actually lighter than you want to be right now no i think right around 300 is a good spot for me i for, for a long time like i said when i was a freshman in high school i was six foot one 165 pounds and so that's that would that put me in the 171 pound weight class and so every summer it was like my goal to like gain weight and um I would, you know, I was obviously growing, I was in high school and stuff, but I, I wasn't doing it like the smart way. You know what I mean? It's like, I remember going to school and like my mom would just like, I was like, mom, I want to, I want to, so she would just like make me like a giant Tupperware of pasta, like no protein or anything. Mm -hmm. I was just eating cold pasta every day at lunch. And, but I would, you know, consistently just kind of gain weight and 20 pounds a summer or something like that. And by the time I graduated high school, I was six three, two forty. And then same thing through college, I graduated probably about 270, 275, and then just kind of worked my way up. But I've always had like a skinny guy kind of metabolism, I guess. Like if I didn't eat a ton of food, like I would, it would come off like super, super mm -hmm. quick. You know what I mean? So it was always like 
conscious of just trying to like shoveling calories. And when I was earlier in powerlifting, you know, when I was first starting off, it was just, you know, it's like everyone's got that dirty bulk mentality. It's like, I'm just going to load up at McDonald's or I'm going to get whatever's cheap and easy. As long as I'm getting calories in, you know, like they'll be good. I remember I used to make these shakes and like they had, it would be like two packets of protein oatmeal, water, kale, and uh, kale just to try and get veggies in. <laughs> so I even like, I'm not like a huge veggie guy. Like it, it was funny. Like when we, when, uh, Sean and uh, Nick and I were living together in 2020, like I would just have like a big thing of spinach and like, I'll still do this to this day where it's like, I don't like, I'm not going to like make, you know, veggies with my meal typically, but I'll go to the fridge and like, just take a big fistful of spinach and just like mm-hmm. eat it. You know what I mean? And kind of go from there. So I would, I would blend these in these shakes and I would put them in shaker cups like this. And I would just bring like two or three of them to work with me and they'd be cold and like everything kind of sat. And it's like, I know how many calories and how much proteins mm-hmm. in there. It's not going to do, it, but I'm just going to slam it super quick. You know what I mean? More mm-hmm. on there. Um, and I feel like the, so I, I've probably stayed right around the same weight for the majority of my powerlifting career. I think my first meet, I was 296. And then, uh, I trended up to like 320 for that, the one time I was a super heavyweight. And then I actually got with a, a nutritionist, uh, Christy Shaw. And, um, she kind of like changed like my whole, like, I, I, I mean, we all have a concept on like protein, fat and carbs, but like, you don't really like imp- how to implement it when to time meals and everything else like that so i worked with her for about two years and like i said she i went from 320 with a 20 28 pound total in wraps down to 296 with a 2204 total in like 12 months and like i said with less gear i just got a cpap and a nutritionist so it's like little like that to me that like taught me like food is very very important like what you're putting into your body and um you know Last couple of years, I think my metabolism's kind of slowed down a little bit. So, like I said, now I'm still 300 pounds, and I'm only eating like maybe said 3,000, 3,500 cal- uh, calories a day. And you know, there's there's probably guys that are listening to this that are under 200 pounds. We're like, I eat 5,000 calories yeah, a day, yeah, and yeah. I can't gain a, a thing. You know, but I think after a certain point, like your body kind of like knows where it needs to kind of be. Now, if I if I skip on those meals, like I said, I'm still low on calories. So if I miss anything at that point, then I'm going to start really kind of dropping weight, but you know, right, right now I'm, I'm pretty, you know, static right now. Like I said, that, that so where's the panic number then? Is it 296? Dude, I, feel, I feel like, yeah, too. If I see 295 on the scale and I look at myself in the mirror, like if I, if I were to look at myself in the mirror, weigh myself and see 295 and then look at myself again, I would look smaller. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like a weird, like number in my head, but, um, for me, it was 284, 284 break me the fuck out. I don't think I've, I've been, been lower than two, 280. That's probably the low been since in the last like 10 years and that was yeah. that was a couple of years ago but it's like it's weird man like it's like once you get to a certain point like that where it's like you get used to being like 300 310 pounds it's like and i know how the back pumps feel or the sweats feel when yeah. you're like you know you're peaking up for a meet and you're all loaded up and everything and it's like I don't know how people do it at like 400 yeah. pounds, man. Like that's like, no, that's right. I talk, guess you get used to it. You talk I about mean, all in man. Like that's yeah, like, yeah, there's, you were talking about that one. Uh, you had a, you had a story you were talking about on a, uh, a video where, uh, you were talking about, you went to a football game with a guy and he was like 400 pounds. And, like you got to kind of experience what he, like he would like sweat through a shirt and he couldn't put a shirt on by himself. And, like, oh, it was fucking went, terrible. It was, <laughs> actually, it was funnier than fuck because it was, <laughs> it was a pro football game that we were invited to. And it was, he was a big fan of the team and it was in Cleveland. And it was fall. Mm-hmm. Right. So it was, it was fucking cold. Right. And I'm at the time I'm three or two, five or whatever. And, and I'm in a t- I'm in a t-shirt wishing I had a hoodie on, mm-hmm. right? And he's sweating like a motherfucker. But I mean, it was it was it was there were so many funny things about that fucking whole entire weekend. But uh, the the funniest ones were we were we went to eat, and the strength coach from one of the teams was there with us. And there's a fucking pile of napkins like this, just <laughs> fucking just full of sweat, man. And and it's, to me, it's just normal. But watch other people's reactions to it's not normal for them. I mean, meanwhile, he still works with O linemen, mm-hmm. but they don't have this problem. Right. Right. It's powerlifter <laughs> specific. Yeah. We had to walk through the mall to get back to the hotel and there was the escalator was broke. So, and I, this guy's just standing, he, he's so confused, like, what to fucking do? Because you know what the answer is, mm-hmm. but he was dreading it. So, but we were from a distance, we're just laughing our ass off. Like, 
like, <laughs> you're like, what's going on here? But then, I mean, it got into it. He couldn't wipe his own ass, and he's got to use it. I mean, it was just funnier and shit. I, but um, that that I couldn't. I got close to almost being that fucking bad, mm -hmm. you know, where it's it was so hard for me to gain weight past a certain point that it becomes so i'm sure you know this it's so fucking uncomfortable oh and but even like like a like a 10 pound swing so like if i'm 300 pounds like i can feel i'm fine whatever yeah. if i go to like 310 312 that's the like that's like if i'm like carrying groceries or like say you're at an airport going to a meet right this is like another one I'm like where craig and i were going to a meet and uh we parked way out in the parking lot and it's like maybe five in the morning, six in the morning, something like that. We drove. And so I got my backpack full of all my stuff and then my gym bag. And he's got the same. And so, like I said, we're, 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 we're going to the meet. So we're loaded up. I'm like, we're both, by the time we get there, and this is still COVID, so we got to wear those mm -hmm. masks. Him and I are both drenched, sweating through our shirts. We still got to fly to wherever we're going and stuff. And we got to carry all of our bags. We're back pumped as hell. It's like we're trying to like find a you know you're sitting yeah. down every every little spot you can get to and stuff like that. But it's like you're you're strong for ten seconds when you get under a bar. Oh yeah, so it's I like mean, that's, yeah. What I, that's what I'm prepared yeah. for. You know what I mean? I mean? At least you're raw. I mean, my my concern if I wasn't big enough, my gear wouldn't fit right. My my core wasn't where it needed to be to yeah. be able to sit into the squat where I wanted to sit. You know, and so I was like, "Fuck, I gotta put." Then it's, it's if I just didn't have to deal with this shit. And could just like lift it what I actually weighed, you know. I, I think that's like something that like you know, like there's like this this big movement now, and I feel like it. it I don't know if you can kind of relate to this as far as like like the sports like it's raw. Like yeah, everyone's yeah. lifting raw now, but there's still everyone that lifts at however they're gonna. But like there's like this like cons you know like uh pe people look at it where it's just like oh that's multiply lifting or this that yeah. or whatever, and I'm like I've trained with multiply people. I've been around it. I've been to those big big meets. Like, you know how fucking hard that, how much That's harder hard. that is? Like, yes. we're talking about just, like, all these different training stimulus as far as, like, stress and, like, how I'm feeling going into the, the gym and everything else like that. Okay, let's put in, like, okay, your shirt doesn't fit properly today or you blow something out or, like, this isn't working or you don't have someone mm -hmm. to set this or that, that. It's a whole other level of stress that, like, I don't have to worry about it. It's like, yeah. I have the privilege of not worrying about it. Well, you know just from, I mean? from a training perspective, take your squat, add 200 pounds, like add 150, 200 pounds, and then put that in your training once every four or three, four weeks. Yeah. Now you got to recover from that. Right. Cause it's I'm no, no multi-ply person's going to say they can squat raw what they do in gear. Right? right. There, there's a gap. Right. And that gaps what their spine has to recover from. Bones are still but, bones. Yeah. Now they figure out how to still train for strength, but yet recover from that same mm -hmm. with the bench and so forth what, what i wish that, the, that all of them would realize all in, all of them is they're all they're all doing the same pursuit training to get stronger we're all putting 16 20 hours a week a at the gym time. you know what i mean we're all putting a ton of time in here so that's why we were talking about this the other day where it's like why are you going to want to we're already such a niche you mm -hmm. know what i mean so it's like why are you going to want to split it up to like okay well this is the division you're in and then Oh, well, this is the federation that you're even doing this in, or whatever. And then drug tested, undrug. We're all doing the same shit. You know what I mean? So it's like, well, see, my theory on that is it's no different than politics as a whole. It's a, it's a minority of people that are saying that shit, where the majority of the people who actually do it and give a fuck about it, yeah, see that it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going through the same process. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's trying to get strong, but the vocal minority makes the silent majority think that's what it is because it's not because anytime you've ever i mean you were just in here there's multiply there's fucking raw that was the biggest bench yeah. i've ever seen yesterday yeah, any person gym, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah like, any gym you go into that represents and has people from all mm -hmm. they all get along they all support they all push each other they're all they're all in the same game mm -hmm. but that's not the perception that people will have online because the silent silent you know the silent majority are the loudest are, are yeah the the vocal minority are the loudest yeah. right where it's it's easy to just re remember that what's on your screen is not the real world as we all know right yeah. you go to the grocery store it's not what you think it would be right right you go to the airport it's not what you think it would be it's not what the news says it's going to be mm -hmm. it's just fake yeah. you know and then but you go into a gym it's like oh fuck everybody in here is after the same things right we're all trying to get better we're all trying 100%. to tooth and claw for that extra five pounds yeah. we're all going to be 
fire it up if you get it. You Not only I mean? that, really fucking interested in how the other people are doing it. Yeah. You know, like, well, how the fuck do you do this? You know, I feel like maybe it's not even like an equipment wise, but I feel I think like the biggest divide would almost be like the like the drug tested versus the undrug tested. And like they look at like one like negatively versus the other. You know what I mean? Where it's like, see, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Right. It's I'd have to I'd have to speak to more of them. Mm -hmm. The lifters. You see what I'm saying? like slow lifters not the vocal minority yeah, yeah 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 that's why i don't know because the ones i've spoken to and people that i've had out on the podcast they're you know ipf drug tested and so forth they're nowhere near what you would think yeah not even close so i really wonder i think a lot of it like we're talking about like, like the the person the people that i have in mind are like it's like those it's it's the quick turnover people they're in mm -hmm. and out of here in, in two three years and then they're on to jujitsu yeah. or whatever yeah. the hell else they're gonna yeah. sit there and go on to you know what i mean and it's like <laughs> but those are the ones that are gonna sit there like i said yeah. the, the vocal minority of it and i almost like what would uh I, i'm trying to think like comparatively because everyone was in equipment kind of coming all the way through but like there was that split kind of in the 90s from like the the multiply and the single ply i don't think it was as big as people think because when i started the company demographics were important mm -hmm. you know so i'm trying to figure out and there was also a time where i was a state chair for the ipa it wasn't long but long enough to know how many members there were yeah and so just with the with the company i'm trying to figure out how big is this powerlifting market for real because it's there's I, there's also a personal training market there's strength code there's a lot of different markets that we that we're in mm -hmm. what is this and how much marketing and you know sponsorship money how much has to, can go in there and so then it's like okay i guess the only way to figure this out is to figure out how many members are in the ipa the apf the it might have been the usapl at the time and then there might have been like a couple of low-hanging fruit ones mm -hmm. that were in there like how many members do they have well, th that wasn't easy to figure out because nobody wants to tell you because it's not as high as they thought. Mm -hmm. So then it was, okay, my cross, my, my other reference is how many subscribers are there of there are of their, of powerlifting USA? Mm -hmm. They're not all powerlifters. So that's going to be an overestimate. So if I can get an overestimate, then a kind of a, you know, this other estimate. And I guessed around, and then Ricky Crane helped me a little bit too, because he's always been trying to figure that out right. at the time. We figured around 20,000 total. Now, out of that 20,000, I knew between the APF and the IPA, the multiply made up maybe about 3,000. Mm -hmm. So you're not talking, you're talking 25%, maybe 30% at the most in multiply, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else was single ply. I know a lot of it was the single ply ended up being drug tested guys in the USAPL yeah. because that was no one lifted wrong the USAPL big. at that point you were single yeah. fly and in the track coming see everybody ends up going and people miss this too you end up going in the track which is most convenient for you to come into right yeah what you go you go to this gym these guys lift in the APF mm -hmm. you do APF you don't know any different yeah. it's just no fuck you just learned the sport yeah. you don't even know there's fucking 85 you know federations right. or whatever it is where a lot of times when they come in and when I came in it was the US U, US USPF yeah. Yeah. right so that was about it. You know, mm -hmm. the APF, it may have, may not have been when I came in, but it's very shortly after, then it became drug tested, you know, not drug tested. So those, those kind of splits there. And then other fractions kind of came after that. But you end up coming in through whatever that track is. And a lot of people never leave that track mm -hmm. because that's the gym, that's, that's the culture. With, that's and then mean. when they go to compete, that's their friends now. Mm -hmm. You know, you like going back to meets because you see people you haven't seen for six months. and. Mm -hmm. you though have navigated this pro thing brilliantly because you fuckers control it not the federation and that's mm -hmm. what's so cool about it and i don't know how you've done it because i've asked all of you from amber to dan and like how in the fuck do you all know where everybody else is going it's kind of like uh a... like a private message on instagram <sighs> i mean it's it's, it's weird how like because you're talking about powerlifting usa like i feel like for me like that's what instagram has become you know what mm -hmm. i mean like that's my Power say that's how I keep up to date with what everyone's doing and where everyone's going and stuff. And so, for to a certain extent, like it's like once you get to us, like I said, like these these pro meets, like you want to go with where all the other big big names are going to be at because one, you can make money there, but two, you're also going to be lifting with all these big, other big name guys. You know what I'm saying? So like, it really kind of comes down to like whoever, like you know, if you see like the the American Pro last year, like that meet, uh, it was hyped up, it was built up. 
everyone who got in got in but then once they see what the production looked like of it and everything i think the live streaming of it really kind of hypes up a lot more of it than you than you can think as far as like if someone sees that presentation they see a gigantic led screen with like your name on it and like all the however legit the platform is and the production that goes into the meet with the live stream and stuff you're like well i want to do that next year that's cool. i want to be up on the screen or i want to do this or that and then like they like say you throw a bunch of big names in there you throw a lot of money and it's like everyone scrambles to get onto these things you know what I it mean? wasn't always that way though i mean it used to, i can go back through history and go back through time that either i've been in the sport even after i was out of the sport where there were a group of people that wanted to do that mm -hmm. that wanted to compete with the best but then there was another group that didn't want to do that yeah they wanted to go over here because they would look better over here if they didn't or go someone against will pass someone squats or whatever else yeah i mean you could some people would call them cowards you know, dodge or whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be but it was it was fucked right Right. Because you wanted everybody to be in the same place, you know, but it would never kind of work out that way. Right. You guys, let's have said you guys have brilliantly done this right to where it's it, the best meat directors are always going to win. Mm -hmm. The Federation doesn't mean a goddamn thing. Not You've proven all. that. Not at all. You, right? you saw my open power thing. I've competed. Yeah. In, you know, most, well, it's most not just you. It's yeah. all you guys. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, that's the last thing that fucking matters. Have solid judging. Judge everybody the same. Put on a decent show. We'll mm -hmm. fucking be there. And all all of you know and it's that i don't think it's been that way you'd have to go all the way back to probably like gary benford's Y nationals yeah i mean you'd have to go that far back to be able to find when there was that much of the competitiveness yeah and and the um depth you know it's 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 wpo yeah a little bit right and i think even like a, from a longevity standpoint that's probably i was trying to think of that when I was coming as far as like meets that have kind of like stood the test of time as, as far as like, that's the, that's the big dance. Like that's the one you want to go to. Like that's the one you mark in your calendar. It's like, that's, that's where I want to end up at the end of the year. But like, it's, it's very, the changes though. It's a rotating door where it's like a lot of meets you go the first year it hits big and you're like, cool. The next year it's, it's a bigger meet. It's cool. It's awesome. But then like, you know, whether there's issues with the meet directors or maybe a lot of, not as many people show up or signed up or whatever. And then by the third year, it kind of peters out a little bit. Same thing, John Hacks. And then it just, it goes away. And it's, it, but it's, you know, I, I'm trying to think like we're, this is, this will be the, the third year of the Ghost Clash, which is the one in Miami that mm -hmm. I'm signed up for here in April. Um, that was the hybrid meet prior to that. So that's maybe like five or five years into it now. But like, that's even like a long time. You know what I mean? Like there was the tribute meet, which is in Texas. That was two years that turned into the showdown, which was was two and then that went away but there's always it always ends up being where there's there's one meet that everyone yeah somehow figures out to be and like even like back in the day like there used to be those like uh those hawaii meets that everyone used to go to and stuff the the record breakers and stuff yeah. and those were like you know you can look at the the list and stuff and there'll, there'll be big names on there and everything you know as far as like an open powerlifting and stuff but like even that was like maybe for like three or four years and then that one kind of even went away yeah what, what happens is the um and I think actors are getting a little bit better about it now is when they, when they put money out there, obviously it helps, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, that's the carrot. I mean, that's the carrot, right? It would be like, how awesome would it be if you could actually have like a million dollar first prize, right? Oh, dude. And then you're bringing in, you're going to bring in people from fucking the NFL. I mean, I mean well, not the NFL, they mean club, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to bring in way more than you thought, but it would be a different thing is what, what I've seen happen throughout going all the way back to bench bashes and, you know, even the record breakers, you have a meat director that throws money out mm -hmm. and they all want to throw out the big money. Right. But it's not sustainable. They don't get the cash, the return. Yeah, they don't get the return. So they'll come out like the WPO. I think the first year was like two hundred thousand dollars. Well, then he's got to figure out how to come up with that the second For the year. next year or make and it then, more or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, more. And they it's like, why in the fuck do you just not take the two hundred and spread it over four years? Yeah. You know, now you got four years of momentum, but they can't. They come out with the first one. And think of all the ones that you can think of in the past. They got the first one, but then they can't match it the second time. Mm -hmm. It's like, why in the fuck don't you just scale it back to make it something that can sustainable, make it sustainable because they got to generate the money from somewhere, you know, it's, and that's not easy to do in a sport of powerlifting where for the longest time I was saying, 
just fuck the big money. Just pay the fucking first place guy. Pay the second place person mm-hmm. 500. Play the third place 250. Third place gets their entry paid for, right? Exactly. Second place gets entry and hotel. That's the funny. First gets their, it's covered. You know, the meat's covered. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and it's like, if I can just break even going into this peak, you know what I mean? Yeah. So with the so, travel and everything yeah, else, the Airbnb's. So they set it up so one or two people make, you know, decent money, mm-hmm. but then everybody else loses two grand on their whole trip back and forth to be able to get there. And that was something that was really cool about uh, this last did in april where uh it was the pioneer open and uh just kind of background with that is i guess there was something where like uh he was trying to get his belt certified or whatever with the usapl Mm -hmm. and there's a huge fee that goes along with that it was like i don't know maybe a hundred thousand whatever the the fee was it was gigantic Mm -hmm. where he's just like well i'm not gonna do that but what i will do is i'll just put all the money that i would have put into certifying Mm -hmm. this equipment into just a prize money and so went out and that was probably the coolest part about this meet that i did in april was that you went out there and as long as your weight class had i think three or four people at the top three get paid deep like good mm-hmm. like it was like 2000 first place 1500 second and like a thousand something that's like covering that. a, mo- a lot or a large point of the trip but literally you had so you had probably like instead of six people walking out of there with money you know men and women top mm-hmm. three you had probably 30 to 30 people like a good chunk mm-hmm. of change i think every, like i said i was just talking about that airbnb that we were at i don't think there wasn't one person that competed that didn't walk out of there with at least like a thousand bucks and i mean as a lifter and i mean it's, it's it, we're not doing this for money but like it sure makes you feel accomplished when you make yeah. a little coin off of it you know oh, what yeah. i'm saying and um i thought that was really cool because that was a pro style meet but you also had people where it was like their first or second meet you know what i mean mm-hmm. so like they get the prestige of like lifting at this meet big money and all these big name lifters there but you know we all you know the big lifters can still show up and they can still make money you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. and they still have a, a great performance and you know great experience at the meet so um it's 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 kind of it's it's frustrating to watch it where like you you see the rotating door of meets and stuff but i think that's kind of that's always the one thing you are assured of is like the sport just keeps going you know what i mean whether you know meet directors come and go kind of deal or whatever but like there's always going to be something next year there's always there's be not a year where there's not a big meet you know what i'm saying we all end up kind of finding that one every single year and everyone typically shows up to that yeah the, like i said it's the i think the lifters have figured it out yeah. you know that they're actually the ones in charge and they determine that and the lifters are the ones that grow the sport as you've seen mm-hmm. you know it's the the more lifters that come in the stronger everybody's going to get you know it's just crazy to think of what's it going to be in 15 years and that's, you know what, what do you, where do you stand on that argument in the sense that like like obviously that you look, everyone can go to open powerlifting and you can look at the numbers and stuff like that. And I don't, I mean, the numbers are bigger compared, like it's as far as like mm-hmm. what we're looking at, you know, like division wise or whatever else like that. But like, I don't think like necessarily the lifters are like, we're not doing anything that's like, we're, we're stronger than the people before us. Oh, I, I think, think you are. You don't think it's necessarily like the training style is kind of going into like, maybe that's what I'm looking at. Like everything has evolved to a point where it's like, it's allowing us to like, it's, it, we're, we're being set up with either information on Instagram as far as, Recover, better training and everything else like that so we're, we're better able to optimize what we're doing hell yeah i mean you don't have to make the mistakes of the 40 years of lifters that came before you yeah, yeah, yeah you know so and you still can you know but a lot of the really stupid ones you're not going to do right you know a lot of that shit's been phased out so yeah you're still going to have high frequency programs low frequency programs but what they look like today compared to what they look like and those are both far ends right mm-hmm. so if you look at what they look like today compared to what they used to look like you know, 30 years ago, it's not even close to the same. Yeah. You know, so it's the training is advanced. The the style has advanced. Lifters are not trying to. The lifters are not being stuck into one style of squatting, benching and deadlifting mm-hmm. like used to be for years. Like you have to do this is what you have to do because this is what everybody says. Right. You know, their styles becoming more. um Fluid. built around where their biomechanics are the best mm-hmm. and that can change of gaining weight and stuff like that too where you know some people were being based upon who they trained with 
being pushed to keep squatting narrow mm -hmm. instead of wide if they're better suited for wide, you know, or vice versa, yeah. stuff like that. So those those things help a lot. The other things that help a lot are the overuse. You're like, you know, you can go hard. I mean, you volume. Yeah. But that's not high volume like Dave Passanella high volume. No. Right. And I'm not trying to fucking challenge you either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But that's not even close to what that is. Bill Kazmaier bench volume stuff. You see those yeah. programs and you're just like, you throw up looking at it. You know exactly. I mean, I mean it's, it's impressive like as all hell, but where's the, you know, how much better? That's the other thing. How much better could he have been? And a lot of the mental barriers are broke now, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come in and it's like, well, shit, you know, this is what but the wreck are, you know, compared to what they were before. So yeah, their lifters are stronger, most definitely, but they, they, they should be right. The, you guys have laid the foundation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Better. I mean, every sport should be that way. Yeah. Like, if a sport ever starts going backwards and there's a problem, right. That would actually, that would be indicative of there's not enough people feeding into the sport to make That's it better out. and powerlifting. There's way more, as I said, there was 20,000 when I tried to figure it out last time I went on open powerlifting, just to try to figure figure out he did in the last year it was like a hundred and fifty thousand huge and that's that when i, I have to don't quote because i'd have to go look to be sure i don't know if i added or i think i took out the high school powerlifting. oh dang so that's, I mean, that's, that's like gonna huge, add because yeah. it added way too many it, it actually flooded the fuck out of it like what the hell because they're also listed as um unlimited yeah. for the bench press oh okay because i was trying to compare like how many unlimited lifters compared to multiply that was one of the things i was trying to figure out mm -hmm. then i'm like what the fuck like what it was not even it was like ridiculously you know like ah uh, fuck it's a high school you know texas high school power you know they're all slingshot on you know whatever they're using yeah they're however even if they're using it, they're all listed as that which I don't like that. You know, I like, I like open powerlifting a lot. I'm not going to bitch and complain because it's a nonprofit type mm -hmm. of thing. I'd like to be able to filter a little bit better, but I suppose if I wasn't such a lazy f ass, I could just download the whole database right. and do it myself. And that's what's kind of cool is, I mean, they're always, they're constantly updating that. And it's like, they're going through like old, like powerlifting USAs and everything else. And I think even that kind of stuff, just talking about like, you know, the benefit we have it's like you know we're standing on like the shoulders of giants or whatever you know what i mean like past mistakes that we don't have to make now because people have made it before but you think about like like someone like a don ridehout who had like a 2300 pound total when people weren't even mm -hmm. getting close to 2000 i mean and it's like what would that guy do now well, you're the communication as well i mean yeah. it's at bet if you had a powerlifting usa subscription you got information about powerlifting once a month yeah based upon the five or eight articles that were in there that and maybe you knew somebody you know i was fortunate i trained in a gym that had powerlifters there but my mm -hmm. base of knowledge was limited to the five six ten people that were in that group yeah then you would compete maybe meet other people now a lifter has the ability to dm almost every great lifter and probably get a reply i think that's probably the it, it's funny how like you know it's like i was i was telling you earlier like how like i like message my girlfriend online and that's you know that's what we started talking we met and stuff i feel like more top level guys at that top level will slide into other top level guys dms like mm -hmm. and like but it's just to pick your brain about something or like you know like hey you could tweak this on your form or what are you doing you know i'll People, it's like, if, like I said, when I'm talking about the sumo thing, mm -hmm. I'll talk to so many people and I'm like, hey, man, can you help me out with this or can you help me out with that? And it's like, I've never talked to you before. I've never met you before. And they're just like, yeah, sure. And it's like, it's, you have this unlimited database of just like, you just have to kind of just go out and, and ask, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, you know. Well, a lot of people make this big assumption that everybody's DMs are full, right? And some are. And so there's going to be some people that don't check them. And there is that, but it's not the percentage people think. Yeah really can say with almost certainty there's a lot of top lifters that get like zero dms about power lifting at all mm -hmm. and if they just if one person dm them like man my bench and they were not a dumb fuck you know yeah my bench is stalling a little bit you know could you look at my they would in a fucking second go look at the video and help yeah you know it's that's crazy compared to if i coming up as a teenager i'm trying to get my bench figured out fucking i gotta hope the guy in the gym might talking about exactly. you see what i'm saying yeah and then i gotta go to a meet and then maybe somebody in the warm-up room might help and then four years later mm -hmm. you know maybe somebody actually says you might want to try to squeeze the bar 
Like, what do you mean? So like, like grip it really hard. Mm -hmm. Like, holy shit, I'm stronger now. You know, that, that, all that has been compressed from like a five year thing into a month. Yeah. You know, it's, I know I can't even make the comparison because it's so vast. So there is over information. Yeah. Without a doubt. I'd rather have that than, and some people at my age d completely disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Like, no, these fuckers need to drive four hours to, you know, and uphill. Pay their and, dues. Pay their dues. Yeah. And shit. Like, dude, man, no. But, the, but the ones that are like the all ins, like they're going to do that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They are going to like, you know, I was, I was joking the other day, like, this is probably the, the furthest I've ever traveled for a squat session. I flew from Florida that morning mm -hmm. and came up here for, but you know what I mean? If you want, if you want to get better and you have to, like, you're going to be able to check yourself and there and ask for that help or want to go out of your comfort zone or go ask somebody that you, that you see them doing something good. Like you're going to want to sit there and do the same mm -hmm. thing, you know? Yeah. Were there any topics that I didn't bring up that you wanted to cover? No, man, I think uh, that's pretty good. Cause I, Oh, I didn't cover your cats. Oh, dude. Yeah. So I, I, feel I got like, the Pokemon, but I didn't get your cats. So I'm definitely uh, a cat. I feel like I listened to something somewhere that uh, <laughs> like Lee Moran was a huge cat guy. And that guy's, you know, I got four cats. You got four cats. Mm. There's this might be a Snapple fact, but I'm pretty sure like cats lower blood pressure. Like that's like a real thing. So it's know. like uh, uh, you how many do you have? Uh, so I've had four at one point. Uh, I have two right now and uh, indoor outdoor indoor for sure but that we have like a little screened in patio and stuff but like yeah dude me, me and my girlfriend are like old cat ladies dude like that's those are like our, our little kids man i don't know i think it started for me in college just because i wanted a pet and then i was always indoor outdoor mm -hmm. right and then i realized that um i didn't have any mice anymore <laughs> like there were some benefits here i mean the cat didn't give a fuck who i was yeah you know, it was one of those and um but there was no more mice I'm like this is kind of fucking nice i feel like you got it's like you almost kind of luck out with cats because like you've i've met people that have cats and like their cat like kind of sucks and they mm -hmm. sense it's like it's it's scared or it's mean mm -hmm. or whatever like it's like it's like a dog you know what i mean mm -hmm. like a pit bull is like like has this perception of being like this big scary animal mm -hmm. but it's like if you raise it the right way like they're teddy bears sometimes too you know what i mean so it's like um i've had both yeah. you know the, the outdoor ones who gives a shit you know they're just a kill they're little fucking fierce predators man oh dude I mean, I just sit there and I'll watch them just like stalk things. And like, they think they're a fucking lion, you know? And they're, they, they're savage too, man. Cause if they kill a bird, they don't just kill the bird. Dude, yeah, they yeah. fuck it up for like four hours. Play with it. <laughs> Bring it to you. I mean, they're serial killers. We've just domesticated. And that's like, you, you, <laughs> you like look at like these like lions and tigers and over thousands of years, we've just domesticated them down to these like chubby little, you know, yeah, cuddle pets. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah like i'll sit there and i'll, I'll watch and you can see this okay i'm trying to look at what what they're stalking yeah, yeah, yeah. okay it's that you know there's no way they're gonna get that it's like a duck the way they're gonna get the duck but they're gonna try <laughs> right <laughs> this is my entertainment right it's it's better than fucking that oh it's way better than tv dude like <laughs> you can sit there and you can get all these different toys and stuff and they just want to play with trash like a, a like yeah. a like a toilet paper roll or like a ball of paper or something like that and they just they're going nuts mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> all right so there's nothing else <clears throat> i think i'm all good man uh, injuries recovery and the pokemon i want to thank you for coming out Dude, this has literally been a giant bucket list thing. Yeah. this is i mean one of the coolest things i've ever done with powerlifting man i, I can't thank you enough for this weekend i'm gonna i'm always gonna no it was great day. watching you train this weekend your form's fucking spot on I which it, which is which is solid minus that foot on the bench that's that's the well that yeah <laughs> well, we, i talked about that but that makes sense man but the the squat you know it's i i i i very rarely do i see people who are doing higher rep sets mm -hmm. where their 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 technique and their form is locked in like what yours was you know as we were trying to tell you were training with man you still got to start the first one mm -hmm. like it's 90 yeah. percent. you can't treat this like an eight rep set for the first for your setup and i feel like that's almost intention warming up like i'll i'll train with people and they're like dude i've never seen someone get so fired up for 225 and it's like you have to like I, it was either it was either eddie cohen or, or kirk karwaski but they were talking about like every single time you go up to the bar it's got to be the exact same thing so you got to grab the bar with the right hand first and then the left and you got to get under and, and wiggle and set all your stuff up but like the intention has to be the same and like obviously as the weight gets heavier you're going to put a little more into it but like every set like you got to just kind of mentally just 
prepare yourself to just kind of explode for that yeah. like that five ten seconds you're going to be under there because normally i'm anti eight reps man because you don't practice technique yeah where yours was the opposite of that you know each one was solid and i almost kind of get into like a spot too where i'm doing like these these higher rep ones and and it's probably it's i wouldn't tell someone else to do it this way but like i'll almost kind of get it to a point where like they're like pistol style like i'm not yeah. going all the way up but like it's like it's like a, a constant tension you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying so like when i when i do it that way like you know and even you know i'll i'll hold my breath for like maybe like five reps at a time or something like that and that's not very good but like yeah. my uh my mentality with that's like if i can do five reps like on one if i can do five reps on one breath like if i can do just you know like i can do the one rep on one breath like i'm i'm gonna be yeah that a makes good, a good spot you know <laughs> that all right i'm gonna shut this down uh thank you again thank you guys for listening we're done as so i want to call out the limited edition apparel the link is in the description as i spoken about before the limited edition apparel is apparel that i basically come up with so some of the designs suck some of them not so much it's a weird thing the ones that i think are going to do really well usually don't the ones i think aren't going to do really well do really well either way they're all limited runs so it changes you know every single month but all edition items are tri-blend material with you know the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are the limited edition items directly support the podcast so head over pick up your shirt today could be a hoodie could be shorts we got these ball hugger shorts right now which i would never wear but i was told they were super popular but you know what they were wrong because they're still sitting there and i probably should discount them right now anyhow if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts over over to the limited edition apparel link in the description box all right guys i'd like to thank today's sponsor merrick health if you've been following the podcast for a while you'll know that merrick was the first company to step up and help support the table talk podcast you guys are selecting merrick for your telehealth platform needs but it also tells me that they're providing the service that you're all looking for they have a couple different that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So you go to the link in the description box. If there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel, that would be the panel that I personally get twice a year, but probably is more suggested to get that full panel once a year. That's checking everything. Optimal performance, longevity, health, hormones, you name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup. You don't need to have the full panel every single time you have blood. I get my blood work done on a quarterly basis. So once a year, there's a full panel. Sometimes there's even more than that. And then there's the checkup panel, which is going to be every three or four months. With a guided optimization, you're connected with a patient care coordinator. And the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are what you're looking for. Anything to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment like you would have if you go to see your physician now. So the discount code again is table talk. The link is in the description box, Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last here. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 8% off or 48% off. It's, I don't know, I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The cabin beyond is three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures, 
for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. It's, if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound. FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train and to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of 